Hey y'all, Scott here, and do I ever have a beef with the National Calendar Society? Months are opinions, not statements, so welcome to the month of Bluth. You see, I was always bummed by the fact there weren't a lot of holidays leading up to Christmas. December is just a month of filler with a climax at the very end, so I've effectively moved the first 23 days of Christmas into its own month Bluth with tons of new holidays. Today just so happens to be why is Scott wearing that hat day? The only problem with the month of Bluth is that the last six days are reserved strictly for empathy. So it looks like I have some time to go before Christmas, and what better way to pass the time than to look through some mail? I'm sold. Yep, this is the one. Always happens to me. Ah, hey all, Scott here. Hey Scott, all here. My name's Terry Lesler and this is my assistant Jeb. Welcome to the third annual Vegans Anonymous meeting. Got a big showing this year. So is this like a convention or a call or a meeting? All right, so we got a little bit of column A, a little bit of column three, and a whole lot in the cult column. You see, this time of year, there sure is a lot of dairy in the air. So we really just gotta come together this Christmas season. It's hell. Wanna join the resistance? Well, anything to beef up my resume's cult section. What? Come you, on! What Why do you, you gotta do it here, Think man? Of the it's case. Christmas season. Think of the Listen, case. I just don't wanna walk out of the house without this thing and constantly ask myself, what if? Well, well, that is what they all say. Guys, I swear I wasn't planning anything nefarious. Listen, what if I make it up to you by spreading Christmas cheer the only way I know how? I don't know. It's pretty hard to trust someone after a stunt like this. To me, you're basically wearing a racial slur on the shirt. Thank you. But come on, give me a chance. It's impossible not to crack a smile while pummeling through Madden 08. Holy shit, there's a Madden 08? I know, I said the same thing when I first saw this game. The 8th Madden? Surely they've truly run out of ideas at this point. But right when I saw the opening cinematic, I knew I wasn't in for the 8th Madden. I was in for Madden 08. EA Sports. It's in the game. It sure is. The opening here cuts between real-life footage and in-game graphics to highlight just how real Madden 08 is, jamming in our skulls the question, who wants it more, and Jesus Christ guys, my hand is as far up as I can make it, I do, I do, I do. After the NFL logo has some heart palpitations, we're greeted to... Welcome home, old friend. The Madden series was based off of the hit book, later adapted into a head coach, and finally turned into video game franchise extraordinaire. It's truly one of the most successful game series out there, even though I'd consider it to be a one-hit wonder. Madden 08 was officially let free to the public on August 14th, 2007 for the PC, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, PlayStation Portable, Nintendo GameCube, Wii, Nintendo DS, Xbox, and Xbox 360, with a Mac version following suit on September 1st, 2007, which means us true Madden 08 fans disregard it hard. But you're probably yelling telling me something I don't know. We're taking a look at the Xbox 360 version here, which many consider to be the best of the bunch, but I couldn't personally choose just one, they're all great. But before we get too deep, spoiler alert, for my favorite team I'm picking the Chiefs, I love Kid Cuisine, and who says video games aren't art? The 8th time's the charm, because we truly have a trifecta going on here. A little to the left we have all the trophies, a little to the middle we have all the class rings I refused to buy in high school, and at a sharp right we have an empty closet for expansion. Madden 08 is the video game to really redefine the Madden 08 genre. We play as the titular character Madden 08 on his trek to get from here, all the way over there, with a football included in there somewhere. Seems simple, but we have so many roadblocks in our way, such as him, him, and even him. Some of the most iconic antagonists in all media. Like many great games, the concept is simple, but has a lot of depth. So many strategies are put into place before you can move. You can even ask a special guest star for advice on what to do exactly. You know, John Madden refused to put his name on the franchise if it wasn't as realistic as possible. That's interesting, so that means real football players can ask the ghost of John Madden for advice. Can't wait to unlock him as a playable character. Let's get into the game. Literally. In the My Madden section, we have to bang out our own custom player. Everybody please welcome Hidden Valley, hailing from Tucson, Arizona. His favorite color is Auburn. In terms of stats, Hidden Valley has the stiffest arm in the county and very little else. But what's Hidden Valley without his team, the Clacks? 
We can customize the jersey color, pants color, helmet color, EA, you've done it again. Madden 08 is the first time I could ever live out my fantasy of owning a football stadium named the Clack Dome. Wait, is this vegan? Sure as hell's a whole lot of pig skin for this to be vegan. Well, if that doesn't do anything for you, then we can move on to another version. Next, we have 2007's Game of the Year runner-up, Madden 08 on the GameCube. Not as fully featured as its Xbox 360 counterpart, but if you can smell competency right now, surely you're getting a whiff of Madden 08 on the GameCube. It was the last game released on the console, and what a way to piss out. You see, this is the kind of game that needs to be re-released in HD on current game consoles. Hopefully, if a re-release does well, we'll see a sequel to Madden 08. Wouldn't that be Madden 09? No. Madden 082. Madden 09 doesn't count. It was an overhyped, underwhelming, spiritual successor to a game that deserved far more. Anyways, the GameCube version oddly has a radically different user interface compared to the Xbox 360 variant. Doesn't make it any less magical. There's so much room for creativity tucked in this game. For example, here's Mr. Madden 08 running away from every number lower or higher than 08. You know what I'd like to see? Madden 08 with the DS. You know, I don't actually have that version. The DS version? You don't have the DS version, you have to have the DS version! I mean, if it makes it any better, we can move over to the Wii one. The Wii one! At long last, we can feel what it's like to Madden 08 with the Wii's motion control capabilities. We can feel every Madden, every 08. This is truly a milestone. This is probably one of the more bare-bone home console versions of the prophecy out on the market. Oh my god, I can't say something like that. It's Madden 08, just a bit simplified. Diet God is still God. The Wii version has a party mode that allows for everybody to join the craze. Only one Wii remote is required per player, and it makes everything way easier to grasp. With only a few flicks, you'll quickly understand Madden 08 is a right, not a privilege. The game is so smart with how it does everything. Even the credits are smart. They have these pockets of blank so you have time to breathe between the list of deities who made this. And on top of that, the music is phenomenal. You listen to that baby purr. Sounds f***ing dumb. Alright guys, alright, wh what's your deal with this? Why are you being so tart with this? Listen man, Madden 08 just doesn't really speak to us. Whoa, how do you know those were my 15 least favorite syllables in order? Just a little too much Madden, not enough about my needs. Not really my thing. What?! It's just too real. Way too smooth, not for me at all. I, I just don't get it! It's Madden in 2007! The, the two perfectly meld together, what more could you possibly want?! I don't know, something better? Hey guys, look what I brought! Holy shit, is that Madden 09? Ah! Jesus, Boomer! What did I tell you about the Madden 09 shit? We lose so many clients to that. Where do you think he's going? I don't know, my guess would be Target. Oh, excuse me, sir. Do you need any help? Uh, wh where's the Madden aisle? Four paces that way and hook a right. Thanks. It's nice to see a Target employee that knows what they're doing. Oh, no, I don't work here. I just love helping people. God, I love vegan bread. Heard you love with vegan coffee, too. It's so vegan. Oh, not again. I locked it. Christmas is ruined. Should we check the trash bag? Nah, that would just be rude. Yeah, you're right. Hey, looks like I was diagnosed with stealing every copy of Madden 18 from Target out of spite-itis because I just stole every copy of Madden 18 from Target out of spite. People need to realize there's only one Madden that matters. There's enough Madden in this world, but not enough 08. Hey everybody, this is a pre-recorded news segment from August 2016. I'm just gonna take a wild shot in the dark and say that all copies of Madden 18 are stolen from Target. Holy sh! I called it! Hey, we've gone viral! Of course, I doubt they'll ever find the stolen loot. The last place anybody ever checks is the white trash bag in the fridge at a Vegans Anonymous gathering. By the way, f*** those guys. Let's play some more Madden 08. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, I'll call you back later. Every single copy of Madden 18 is gone from Target. I think we need to get you new who on the case. I think it's worth this time. Every single copy of Madden 18 is gone. We got a mission for you. I'm on it.
Officer Wool. Steel Wool. Gotta tackle the original Xbox version next. Huh. Really should have put a notice on the box before I bought this console. Anyways, that means it's time to crack out the original Xbox for this bad boy. And man, this is... Uh, Madden 08. Kinda like most Maddens on the console. Let's move abruptly over to the PlayStation 2 version. Which is Madden, alright. PlayStation 3, it's... Madden. 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 Madden! <gasps> what have I become? Turning to WebMD, it turns out I'm diagnosed with most peopleitis, which means I'm numb to Madden 08's effects. It's just a phase over, don't worry. I'll be able to understand the differences between each version of Madden 08 and what makes it better than all Maddens in no time. But to aid me in my recovery, I've always feared this would happen. So I have my just in case Madden 08 loses its edge emergency bag on standby. This bag scientifically proven to show me how well I had it off with Madden 08 being my only Madden of choice. Ew. Uh, this is just hilarious. Hey guys, look what I brought. Holy shit, is that Madden 09? I don't know man, I just feel overwhelmed with... I can't really understand why. Looks like I got a postcard. I'm I'm gonna brush my teeth if you don't mind. Hey y'all, 911 here. We're just calling house to house and seeing if you personally stole all the copies of Madden 18 from Target. Listen, man, I don't have time for this. I'm brushing my teeth because of. Based on past experiences, that doesn't sound like you're brushing with toothpaste. Sounds like you're brushing with braid. Not again. Dishonored my legacy. Well, when you put it that way. <gasps> well, that was fing terrifying. Not that I would expect anything less from a raid buzz. But nothing's more terrifying than the post raid buzz buzz. Hey, check this out. The Madden is off the charts at the VAG, and the 18 meters not too far off. That might be where the stash is. Is Officer Wall on his way there? Knowing him, he should be close. Oh, shit. He's just been driving around in circles for the last half an hour. Let's just go there ourselves. Where is he? Get on the f***ing ground, you f***ing scumbag! Be s***ed the f***! Nope. No sign of Madden 18 here. Wait. Remember the last Madden scandal? Sh Check the fridge! Why? Why did you do it? That is embarrassingly vague. Stealing Madden 18 and blaming out a bunch of vegans. Oh! That! Well, you see, they didn't like the right version of Madden, and I'm not really fond of the new version of Madden, so killing two birds. No stone involved, though, that's just too messy. Who even are you? I am Louis Castillo, the cover athlete of the Spanish version of Madden 08. You should feel overwhelmed with guilt for your actions. You have stolen various copies of our franchise's newborn and have blamed it on the innocent. I don't feel guilty. I did the world a favor by ridding it of all 18s, and those pesky vegans deserve to take the blame if all they like is Madden 09 and can't see why Madden 08 is the best one. America can finally rest easy knowing the Madden 18 bandits have finally been caught. 200 copies of Madden 18 have been found in a white trash bag in the fridge of the third annual Vegans Anonymous gathering. The following footage has just surfaced. We don't know. Where's the f***ing AP? I'm f***ing you and then 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 I'm f***ing you and
Well, that's your belief, but I'm personally more of a Madden 13 guy myself. You f But you can't expect people to believe in what you believe. What's the point of beliefs if there's only one thing people can believe? Shit, I'm an asshole. Lewis, I was wrong. I'm gonna make this right. Where are you going? Probably to jail for an undiscernible amount of time. See you later. Suffer Crane Crook here, guys. Have at it. Didn't you hear? Man 28 was just announced. The price of Man 18 has dropped tenfold. I guess this means you can steal as many Man 18s as you want. Thank you for your service. Godspeed. This just in. Man 28 has just been announced. Leave it to EA to make this the best Christmas yet. The Man 18 bandits have now recently been transferred on the FBI's most wanted to the who gives a piss section. If you see these people, please, at all costs, don't give a piss. I'm sorry. I, I got carried away with the whole concept of Madden 08. It just means a lot to me. Listen, I mean, you guys like a different Madden. I, I'm gonna have to learn how to respect that. I won't push my belief of a great Madden onto you if you won't push it onto me. You kidnapped and framed us! Yeah, that's one way of putting it. I'm not gonna go for a nice restraining order right about now. Roger that. See you later. I, I wanted to give you guys this. Thanks. That guy. Well, we survived the six days of empathy, and I have a little something something that arrived at my doorstep. Oh, nice! Cool. It also came with a little invitation to something. Oh, yeah, there is no way that could be misinterpreted. Hey all, Scott here. I'm legally obligated to state the following. Three hoes and a merry Jesus birthday is on December 25th. Christmas is almost here! The time of year all about facial hair and obesity and whatever the hell a yuletide is. But most importantly, it's about the joy of getting a Red Dead Redemption 2 Collector's Edition that includes everything except Red Dead Redemption 2. Great! I love Red Dead 2 merchandise, but I just refuse to own the game. Listen, I need a right quick way to prove to everybody that I have copious amounts of money and I hate sex. It's a Christmas miracle! With the announcement of almost every big AAA release these days, word of an expensive collector's edition of the title is sure to follow. Ah, the collector. Hey! A seeming pile of virginity who cares deeply about how his Yonoid cartridge looks. Almost every pop culture medium has collectors, but I'd argue video games are a special case. They're inherently collectible. Many titles can only be played on specific hardware, sometimes with specific accessories. Couple that with the fact that video game preservation simply hasn't been taken as seriously as other artistic mediums when it deserves and needs to be, and hopefully you can see why I, alongside many others, find collecting video games to be a fulfilling hobby. And it's pretty obvious, video game publishers know this, and thus offer limited versions of their games, coming with all sorts of this. I think the first collector's edition most people remember was The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Times, which was a value-soaked box. It came with a gold cartridge. You don't see that every day. Ever since that release, collector's editions, limited editions, special editions, whatever you want to call them, have gotten increasingly popular for publishers to offer. It can be fairly pricey in comparison to the standard releases, so when one is announced, it's fair to ask, alright tough guy, why should I buy this? Well luckily, I got an early Christmas present in the form of a bunch of irrelevant collector's editions, so let's take a look at them all and see what it takes to be a good collector's edition. Alright, what do we have here? Oh, <laughs> Aliens Colonial Marines. Yeah, this game turned out to be a little too fucking terrible for most people's liking, but we don't care about that. How does this collector's edition stack up? I like the packaging, and this box set comes with some sheets of paper. 
Paper with words, paper with pictures, even paper with, here you go, some expired DLC codes. Collector's editions that come with DLC just seems like a cheat. Like, come on, that's not collectible. Give me something physical. These documents are kind of cool. Aliens fans are sure to get a kick out of them, and by that I mean they'll look at them, smirk, and then never look at them again. We get some patches included as well, but the star of the show is the premium NPVC collectible. That's premium with a capital um. I mean, overall, this collector's edition isn't too bad. It feels like more thought and care was put into this than the actual game. But it originally retailed for 100 bucks, and when you look at it that way, for 40 bucks more, you got an okay figure, some patches, paper, and more weapons in the game. Uh... The Mega Man Legacy Collection, a great way to experience the series in my opinion. Released on PS4, Xbox One, and PC in August of 2015, with a 3DS release coming later in February 2016. Alongside physical releases of the PS4 and Xbox One versions, Capcom also released a collector's edition exclusive to the Nintendo 3DS. So we get the game, some postcards, which I really want to know if anybody actually used these things as actual postcards instead of doing the tried and true. That's cool. But of course, the main event is the Amiibo. This box set comes packed in with the Smash Brothers Mega Man figure, now gold flavored. All right, few things about this. One, this comes in a completely blank package. Cool. Two, from what I've read, this Amiibo doesn't have any exclusive features to it in any game. It's just a Mega Man Amiibo. You can unlock certain challenges in Legacy Collection with it, but this works with any Mega Man Amiibo. So unless you're a diehard Amiibo collector or a huge Mega Man fan, this Amiibo is one of the more pointless releases. This was 50 bucks when it released, a solid $20 more than the standard version. Amiibo were all worth $13 back then, so overall the value of this package is 43 bucks, and you're spending $7 more for postcards. I bought this when I was still in a bit of an Amiibo phase, and I already owned Legacy Collection on the PS4. So really, I didn't play the 3DS version all too much, and already owned a standard Mega Man Amiibo. Yeah, safe to say I didn't get a lot of value out of that purchase. Street Fighter Cross Tekken. This comes with 45 gem power and people still say the economy's in shambles. We get a copy of the game with exclusive cover art that denotes it's the special edition. Well, that's nice. An exclusive prequel story comic book? Well, it's well illustrated, but it's just a part of the instruction manual. Hey, I mean, an upside to this is that it's probably way harder to lose as it's just gonna sit in the game case since it's also a manual, but it also feels like they were cutting some costs. However, it's all about the Street Fighter Cross Tech and Arcade Cabinet Replica Piggy Bank. How's that for a catchphrase? Well, it's a plastic, non-functioning arcade cabinet you can spank some coins into. You have to assemble this yourself and... Childbirth? Kidney stones? Assembling the Street Fighter Cross Tekken Arcade Bank. This thing is dreadful to put together. You have to apply so much pressure to these pieces and it never feels like you're doing it correctly. But in the end, it's all right. This is kind of cute. Nowadays, I don't think it's totally out of the question to offer playable mini arcade cabinets and collector's editions, but back in the horrifying year of 2012, this was all they could do. I believe it retailed for $70, so for 10 bucks more than the regular edition, I think this was definitely passable. Life is Strange Limited Edition. This one is simple and straight to the point, and in my opinion, is quite good for the price. A hardcover art book, the game's soundtrack on CD, and a downloadable director's commentary, all in a nice box. I mainly like this one because it includes stuff that actual collectors and big fans would legitimately enjoy and get use out of. They all fit the tone of Life is Strange, plus it was only $10 more than the regular edition. At that point, why not pick up this version? Ooh, Call of Duty World at War, a game based on World War II, how fun! Now this one is pretty lame, just a bunch of multiplayer bonuses are included, but what do you get physically with this box? Well, a box for everything to come in, that's nice, and also a collectible canteen, well I'll be. I can't wait to drink out of this thing and consume water and swallow liquids, F my night's ruined. This canteen doesn't open at all, it's literally just a prop. I feel like it would have cost them less to just buy real canteens that you can actually drink out of. Now I don't have a canteen to drink out of, what am I supposed to do in a life or death situation? Don't worry guys, we'll have plenty of canteens, I stocked up on World of War Collector's Editions. You fool! <laughs> hey, Xenoblade Chronicles X, this is the game with the yellow round guy, right? Yeah, during the Wii U era, I bought a lot of Nintendo published stuff just to support them in their time of need, and that included buying the special edition to a game in a series I am not into. At the very least, this is a really classy, well-done release. We have an insanely meaty art book, a matted art card, all right, and the game soundtrack on a USB drive. Now this thing feels substantial, it feels quality, and it's f***ing dreadful. It only includes 10 songs from the soundtrack. You'd think since they were putting it on a USB flash drive instead of a CD, it would be easier for them to include the whole thing. On top of that, the flash drive can only hold 800 megabytes worth of content, which makes it next to useless to use as an actual flash drive. And on top of that, there's messy DRM with the soundtrack, meaning you have to keep the flash drive in to listen to the songs. 
least it looks cool. A blue light flickers when the drive is inserted and it gives off vibes of the skills in the game. You see, I can Xenoblade a little bit. Saints Row 2, everybody's favorite Grand Theft Auto game until a real Grand Theft Auto game comes out. Look at this nice tin, it's like there's a real back in front of me. We get an art book, which feels like trash. The quality of this paper is in line with kids menus, and plus out of all games I want to see art from, Saints Row 2 is definitely not in the top 10. A money clip, and finally, I have a bullet USB drive. It comes with a bunch of wallpapers and can store a full gigabyte of data. Well, there you go. Saints Row 2 narrowly beat Xenoblade X for Game of the Year. And that's about it. Overall, not the most impressive out there. Holy sh! it comes with a poster. This one ain't too bad. It doesn't include any big cool things, but it includes enough small things to make it interesting. Batman Arkham City. This is one that really gets a lot right. A really high quality statue of Batman alongside an art book, a DVD copy of a movie, a soundtrack, and a mountain of DLC codes. Now you may ask where the game is. Oh, come on, guys, you got so much right, and then you put the game in the art book. That's just inconvenient. Really, collector's editions can be cool. It's just there's a lot of things going against many of them. Sometimes they're anything but collector's editions. They might be overproduced and thus put on clearance, ending up cheaper than the standard edition because guess what? Nobody wants a toilet-sized box with Easter eggs in it. This copy of MVC Infinite has been rotting at my Best Buy since launch. Guys, if no collector has bought this thing by now, nobody's ever gonna buy it. You know what stings? When there's like a billion different editions of a game. Ubisoft does a lot of this, where there's the standard edition, deluxe edition, gold edition, gold digital edition, ultimate digital edition, the Spartan edition, and the Pantheon edition. Who's like, man, I want this $160 one, but I don't know about that $220 one. And when certain content is only in certain editions and there's not one version you can buy that gives you all the content, that's just dumb. Also, I hate it when collector's editions come with box art that's just straight up worse than the standard edition. Smash Brothers Ultimate, this special edition comes with a slick pro controller and a steelbook. That's awesome, but it doesn't come with the standard case for the game, and let's be honest, this steelbook does not compare to this artwork. Weirdly enough, Nintendo of all companies doesn't do a ton of limited editions. They do them every now and then, like with Breath of the Wild. We got a special edition and a master edition. For a hundred bucks, you got a switch carrying case, a map, a CD, and a coin. And for an extra 30 with the master edition, you got a statue of the master sword. I personally didn't see much value in either one, so I passed. But that's the thing about collector's editions. Most items included in them aren't inherently valuable or rare most of the time. They're just supposed to be little things that collectors and diehard fans would find cool. So yeah, while many of them are kind of waste of money, and you're probably going to look at the things included maybe twice and ever again, it's all about whether you see value in the purchase. And damn it, I wanted the keychain with Puyo Puyo Tetris. Collector's editions can be lamer than lame sometimes, but hey, if you personally see some value in one, Go for it. It's not like some of them are the only versions released of certain games, falsely advertise their contents, include items that you're never going to use, take up 500 square feet of your house, are ludicrously overpriced, or one of 15 different versions, none of which come with all the content, or just call Collector's Edition on the box for no reason. Yeah, that would be ridiculous! This is the story of a boy who talked about stupid Nintendo games. Ever since 2017, he's done it 149 times and shows no sign of shame. Every single week he'd go Madden 08 this and fling smash that. It's really impressive how many sentences he could start with, hey all. Any professional could make the argument he's gone off the deep end, but I think it's just how he's always been. He just enjoys talking about these things, regardless of what situations he gets himself into. Plus, he buys a lot of stuff, like a lot of stuff, and he stated on multiple occasions he evades taxes. Like, Jesus Christ, I think he does it for fun! But with the Christmas season upon us, his passion may have finally brought him towards a bit of a crisis. Hey all, Scott here, and it's that time of year, the spending season, when it's okay to splurge a little bit and say, you know what, I, I could use a toothbrush. Yesterday was my go-to buy Flink Smash day. The day before that was buy the rights to Socks day. Didn't pan out, lost a few grand. The day before that, I bought a few shares of Loot Crate. I should read the news more. And today, I'm gonna get my gallbladder removed just for the hell of it. I'm broke. 
Hi, Scott Wozniak, bankruptcy activist. Case West, bankruptcy patrol. So I was hoping you could help me out a little bit here. According to the bank, government, and wallet, I have no money. Are you sure? Most people who claim bankruptcy have a forgotten gift card or something. I was actually gonna ask you to see if you could check my account and see if I left an Arby's card there or something. I don't know what to tell you, man. You're completely broke. Oh my god, I don't know how this could have happened. Really? You don't know why you're broke? You brought your entire stack of Fling Smash. Never leave the house without it. Never? It's a bitch. No one man needs this much Fling Smash. And why are they all wet? You don't get it, do you? Bankruptcy is just a hobby of mine. I'll quit it tomorrow and buy out the bank to replenish my funds. You don't have any money to buy the bank out with. Can you give me a loan to? This is great. I prefer Christmas too. Is bankruptcy a crime now? Is it illegal to be worthless? Well, if it is, I'm f***ed. Now, I did come to an agreement with the bank. Do you accept war bonds? Listen, I'll make you a deal. Do you want the bank to take every one of your possessions? Would you take my crippling debt? No. Thank God, no. We have to do charity work every year. If you can do 50 hours of charitable work in the name of the bank, we can help you out. Oh man, I love charity work. That's the first time I've ever said that. Doing charity work is all I need to do to go from bankruptcy to struggling, and helping out the less fortunate is what I'm best at. I've not killed my fair share of bed bugs. I always look out for the little guys. So I just have to pick out a charity to benefit, which is tough, there's so many. There's the Kill All Bed Bugs Association, they would not like me. Justice for Squirt, bringing awareness to America's 98th most popular soft drink. No, I hate politics. Oh, the Foundation for Recent Murder is a charity benefiting those who have recently been murdered. That's a great cause. A death is the most common cause for death, so to bring awareness to that and to help those who have recently died should be more than enough for charity work. Well, with the Christmas season approaching, I definitely want to give those who are less fortunate gifts. The problem is, I have nothing. Nothing at all. I have to come up with something that's affordable beyond belief, but gives off the illusion of significance. Wait. What was the value of Connect Adventures? F***ing worthless! That's it! This cost me a nickel. Video games are some of the priciest forms of entertainment out there. Most releases, 60 bucks a pop. You know how much house you could buy with that? I'm not telling you, ask a realtor. Games are expensive, there's no getting around that, which is why every single title enters the circle of life. See, we started 60 bucks when the game initially released as that's fun, people love a good joke, but see, when people buy the game brand new and beat it all and have nothing else to do in the title, how are they gonna fund the next game they wanna buy? Well, they could work for money. <laughs> You can sell that game and then use that money to buy new game. So sell your $60 game for $40 after you're done with it. Some sap will buy your used copy for $50. That sap sells their $50 game for $30. The fucking moron who bought that game sells it for $15. The idiot who buys that game for $15 sells it for $5. And then the me who buys it for $5 is pretty much stuck with it because why would I sell it? To use a phone booth? Many games maintain their value for years, sometimes even increasing in price if there's a high enough demand. But what about the games that just plummet in value? The games that rot on a game store shelf for years. Nobody buys them. Ever. And as time goes on, more and more copies pile up because nobody wants these games. They're completely worthless. The price keeps going down until it reaches rock bottom and even then nobody wants it. This, my friends, is the bargain bin game. Games that just refuse to sell at all. Like Smallpox sells more than Battleborn. Piles of these games crowd used game store shelves, all for dirt cheap. Three bones, two bones, one bones, 50 cents, sometimes even pennies. But why aren't people buying these games? Those are some crazy prices. Like, come on, these are in fact video games. Being able to pick one up for the price of integrity, well, that's a steal. Well, allow me to dissect what it takes to be a bargain bin game with the four categories of the dollar bin. You think you have what it takes to be f***ing worthless? Take notes from the pros. Games that are pretty much unplayable in their current state, whether that means a game that was online multiplayer only and said online multiplayer has either been shut down for years or nobody's playing it or the game is Glee Karaoke Revolution Volume 3. Yeah, I was surprised too when I pulled this off the shelf and saw the price. What? Well, when you do some critical thinking, it does make some sense. Pretty much any game that requires a peripheral and is sold with just the game, they are pretty much all in the dollar below crowd. DJ Hero, Band Hero, Karaoke Games, Dance Pad Games, I mean, many of these titles, you pop them in, they're giving you the stink eye. Yes, yeah, Scott. Where the hell is your SingStar microphone? There are the games that require toys to scan in. Disney Infinity, Skylanders, Lego Dimensions. I mean, what are you gonna do without the toys? Yeah, that's what I thought. Now the dance pad games, you can usually play with a controller, but look me in the eye and tell me you want this. Now a few games maintain their value even without their accessories. Some of the Guitar Heroes are still fairly pricey, but that's because people miss Guitar Hero. Now, why is Band Hero only 99 cents in comparison? 
because nobody misses Band Hero. What the hell is the difference? You're playing a band in Guitar Hero 2. These are games that are fundamentally paperweights in their current form. Stores like GameStop have to accept them as trade-ins because, well, they are games. But nobody was buying Starlink with the toys. What makes you think somebody wants it without? So, worthless equals games that are missing accessories that sort of make these games playable or online-only games that do not work anymore. Games that are constantly getting new versions every single year. When the latest FIFA comes out, last year's becomes completely irrelevant. And if you think FIFA 19 is worthless now, where does that put FIFA 15? You mainly see this with the sports games. FIFA, MLB, NBA, PGA, NFL, ABBA. You may ask, what's the point of spending $60 on the new versions when last year's and the year before that and the year before that featured games that were pretty much the same but with a few differences? To answer that question, I will answer this question. What's the meaning of life? I don't know. Some yearly titles do maintain value, even some sports games do. I've been jonesing for a complete Madden 08 collection, but the PSP and Mac versions are somewhat pricey. I made some mock-up copies to get a good idea of what it will be like to actually be happy. Games that everybody owned for a while there, but now... Nobody cares anymore. Games that were fads or games that were bundled in with consoles or controllers. Like, pretty much every PlayStation Move owner got sports champions with it. Does that mean every PlayStation Move owner didn't sell the game? I don't even think any PlayStation Move owner still owns a PlayStation Move. These Sega Superstars Tennis Xbox Live Arcade Combo Pack, yeah. Uh, these were included with a ton of Xbox 360s, which meant a metric 70% of Xbox 360 owners didn't want the games because GameStops are made of these games. Be off the wallpaper, you'll find them. Now, of course, there's also the fad titles, games that nobody wants to play anymore because because nobody wants to play them anymore. Connect games and Wii Party games. Like, I don't even think the developers want these. <laughs> yeah, these are just bad. Games that nobody wants because they're just not good. Some of these games immediately hit the bargain bins within a year or two of release. Anthem, knowledge is power. That's you. Look at these price points. They're pathetic. Games that not only rot on the store shelves when they're used and years old, but games that do so when they're brand new. Stores could never get rid of these things no matter how hard they tried. They're legitimately it's just nobody who really wants these things. It's bargain bin titles can be pretty much anything, but those four categories are the most common reasons they're the undesirables. When somebody trades in one of these games at a GameStop, they're fundamentally sending these games off to die. Nobody buys these, and if they do, half the time they harvest these copies for their cases to use on games they actually care about. But that doesn't mean there isn't inherent value to some of these games. Truth or Lies without the microphone, that's oddly enough better than Truth or Lies with the microphone, it's completely unplayable in this state. I mean, the Naked Brothers banned for a dollar. Come on, these opening animations are alone are worth admission. And hey, buying a video game for so cheap, that's fun! It's like adopting a child that's older than you. Like, this shouldn't happen, but hey, it's a cool story to tell. I got a game for 50 cents. And what better gift is there than video games? These things were expensive at some point in time. Name better press than giving murder victims Battleborn. I should really do something big for these guys. I'll throw a charity gala. I just need to find a way to fund it. Can I take out a loan? What the f is wrong with you? I'll just sell something! The only question is, uh, what? Uh, I could sell uh, Ridge Racer 6. <laughs> That's not f***ing happening. I'll never sell my copy. I'm broke, not stupid. Well, I'll just look up how much debit cards sell for. Alright. Welcome to Scott's Charity Gala for Recent Murderies, a place where we address certain problems in this world with kindness. Not ready yet. This is gonna be the greatest charity event of all time, and I'm not just saying that to ensure the bank doesn't repossess my items. Listen, man, we need some great press. This event needs to be stellar. We wanna see some happy murder victims. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. I got a secret weapon. Spree flavored candy canes. Cashier told me it would be a hit. I may have banked too much on this. All right, food, spree, presents. I think we're ready. Welcome, murderies, to the first centennial charity gala for recent murder victims. I knew it was a good idea getting murdered. <laughs> oh yeah, we all went to that dinner party together, got murdered, got treated for it. How was all that? Well, have you ever died? Not personally, but I'll get around to it eventually. This is great. I know these guys. We all went to Chet Chef's dinner party. Great food. Ended in murder. But everybody was diagnosed with murder except for me. These guys got treated. And look at them now. But that's the thing. They all survived, and they all already like me. So I just have to make sure they rave about this gala. So I'm just going to try to sweeten the deal for all of them. Terry and Jeb, vegans. I laced their meat with tofu. Rex Mose, school dance chaperone. I color coordinated all the things that aren't beer so he knows what he should and shouldn't eliminate. Wendy's employee, Wendy's employee. I heckled some Arby's drive throughs before I came here. I didn't even know he was coming tonight. It works out perfectly. Listen, these guys have seen it all. It must have been hell to go through the recovery process after being murdered, but it'll all be worth it after they get their gifts. Hey, there's my favorite murder victims. Hear that? We're his favorites. How are you guys liking the gala so far? I hate it. Reminds me when I got murdered. How? That. 
What am I supposed to call you guys? I'm a big proponent of the term hospital junkies. Well, I'm more of a fan of the term charity messiah. What are you talking about? That describes no one in this room. What's wrong with him? Oh, you see, well, he's simply bludgeoned to death, but at the hospital, the doctors wrongfully diagnosed him as a burn victim. Can't you just take them off? Not if he wants to recover. <clears throat> well, I think it's a good time to make my speech. The holiday season is one of the greatest yet most stressful times of the year, whether it's because of money problems or getting murdered. It's easy to forget the true purpose of Christmas time. It's to set aside our differences and enjoy the company of each other, to express gratitude and empathy to those truly special in your life and to those in need, regardless of any differences that separate us all. This event is in support of the foundation of recent murderies. My colleagues, Terry Lessler, Jeb Jab, Rex Mose, and Wendy's employee were all recently murdered and are now in recovery. I truly cannot think of a greater pain to endure. Maybe go. I propose a toast. This event had a single sponsor, being Ice Mountain Mini Bottled Water. When you're thirsty but not that thirsty, Ice Mountain Mini Bottled Water available now. So please, raise an ounce to you. Merry Christmas. Jesus, that tastes small. So to end things off, to make your insufferable pain more fun, I got you all gifts. Is it a cure for zero degree burns? Oh, even better, listen. Take them, open them up, and let me know when you guys forget that you were totally murdered a few months back. What is this? We got American Idol on PS2. It's $2.99, of course it blew. Karaoke revolution with no microphone, that might be fun. DJ band and guitar hero, just the games, price point zero. Games are games, ignore the fuss. FIFA, they're in everywhere. 99 cents, that's not even fair. Skylanders, it was just a phase. I turned these copies into a maze. Lego Dimensions, that really exists? I guarantee you, it was a miss. Games that are the anti ass. Just take paddleboard, you swine. Play it before it goes offline. Madden 16, 17, 18. Not as good as 08, pretty blatantly. But who cares? It's at a great price. Presents that'll make anybody say nice. Gifts with value and some class. It's a Yeah! What the f? Pretty cool, right? Those are games, video games. And I gave you like 50 of them. Yeah, but these are terrible. I, uh, I feel like I've been murdered all over again. Is this even legal? G guys, I'm sorry. I just didn't have enough money for gifts. That's all I could have done. Oh, you didn't have enough money for actual presents, but you had enough money for that sign? Honestly, I've had that in my trunk for years. What even is this? That's NBA Life 14. Well, knowing that makes this present worse. I've been murdered far too many times to accept the Lego dimensions for Christmas. And what am I to do with all these Maddens? 25, 15, 16, 08? You son of a bitch! You son of a bitch! Whoa, all right, we weren't the ones who just give out trash for Christmas. Well, excuse me for loving bankruptcy. I'm only doing this to get out of the hole. Well, you're only doing this for the money? And you gave us Battleborn? I'm, I'm sorry, okay, listen, let me try to make it up to you. Terry, Jeb, have a burger. We're vegan. Yeah, I know, no cheese. Listen, just stop, okay? What's going on? Oh god, he's been drinking too many of the Ice Mountain mini bottles. He's way overhydrated. Somebody give him some sand! I do something nice for them, and they blast me for it. They hate me. The charity event's gonna bomb. The bank's gonna take all my stuff. <sighs> Scott. What? Scott. Sounds like Chip Shaft. It is I, the ghost of Christmas Shaft. Chad, everybody else who was murdered at the dinner party recovered. You were murdered, and you- Were murdered. I just died. Oh man, you're a ghost, you can answer this. Would it be vegetarian to eat a ghost cow? What kind of question is that? So picture this, right? Standard cow, kill it, eat it, the American dream. But like, if a ghost cow appeared before me like you are right now and I harvested it for its ghost meat, like, I'm eating a cow, but I didn't kill a living thing to eat that cow, so what would it be? I've only been dead for a few months. I'm not a professional ghost yet, I just do it on the weekends. Well, why are you here? 
Because I'm a ghost and you need help. Let's talk. Seriously, this is my worth to him? Connect Adventures? I'm a Wendy's employee for God's sakes. Yeah, you know, I'm sick of people assuming I want NHL 16. Like, stop! Guys, look at this. What am I supposed to do with this? Actually, uh, I can sell this to my Rock Band 2 guy. He loves stuff like this. You know, actually, I could really use a new copy of Truth or Lies. Mine got worn out. And you know, I could use another emergency copy of Connect Adventures. Oh my god! There's a Wii Play! I tried to be nice to them. I got them all that stuff and they just acted like I was treating them like garbage. Well, you did get them battle I just... I just really need them to like me and what I did and... Now I'll have nothing. See? That's the problem. You weren't doing a lot of that stuff out of the goodness of your heart. You were doing it because it benefited you. Most people can see right through insincerity. Not me, I invest in Ponzi schemes when I'm bored. They obviously saw that you bought them those games because they were worthless. You treated them like they were worth banned here. Banned here? But I did so much for them! I sold my desk to fund the gala! Follow me. You know, after trading these games around, pretty happy with us. Yeah, I'd rather die than be caught with Battleborn, but Connect Adventures on the other hand, this uh, just saved me buying my fourth copy. Maybe we were a little hard on him. To be fair, guys, he, he did give us Battleborn. And what the hell is this? Spree? Oh. What the f Just right this way. God, I hate yards. The desk you sold is here now. Why is the desk in a dress? It has a new owner. That's just how he uses it. He's feeding it tea. Why is he playing tea with the desk? That's just what he wants to use it for. Well, yeah, but it's a desk. The point is, look how happy he is. Giving up your desk to fund an event for those in need and having it go to someone who will love it just as much as you did, you should be proud of that. You know, even if we didn't like some of these gifts, we found some we did like. And just because some of these are worthless to somebody, it doesn't mean someone else won't find value in them. That's a good point. Like, I hate organized crime, but that doesn't mean you want to ruin their fun. You know, he left a receipt here. It looks like he sold his desk to fund this. Oh. What the f You know, I didn't have a desk for 12 years. And look where I am. Murdered. I haven't shaved in 12 years. You shaved when you were 10? Seriously, no desk? What kind of freak has no desk? A freak who's willing to give it up to give others something nice. Yeah, like these Ice Mountain Mini Waters. Tastes like a fresh puddle. They already hate me, what's the point? Hey Scott, let you know man, just listen sometimes. You gotta do things to make it all right, man. Regardless of how hard they just make it be. I don't know who the f that is, but thanks. Listen guys. That's Mr. Guys to you. I'm sorry. I treated you all like you were worthless and that's just not the case. Sure, I started doing this to get out of bankruptcy, but I realize there's so much more to this than just what benefits me. Well, we want to apologize also. We should be more grateful for what we were given, and we were way too harsh at first. And to be quite honest, this copy of Connect Adventures really hits the spot. Yeah, and I needed some firewood, and you know, Skylander Supercharger did just that. I didn't know what I was doing on Tuesday, but now I know. And DJ Hero too makes a pretty mean play. We know how much you went through to make all this for us, so we wanted to get you this. Mad annoying on the Mac! And this. Mad annoying on the PSP! And this. The OA collection for the PC! And this. Nah, I'm good. Oh my god, I finally have all the Madden 08s! God, sound like you did good, man. You did good, bro. Vince Young! You really did it. Keep up the great work, man. We all proud of you, man. Yes, of course. You're so much smaller than I expected you to be. Is he okay? Yes. He might be dehydrated. I know just the trick. Oh!
Thank you. Keep up the great work, bro. It's missing a leg. It's close enough. Doing the funeral homes that way. We're not going to a funeral. I knew that was the only way to get you in the car. What the hell? I bought new shorts for that. You've been going down a bad path lately. How lately? About the past 23 years, give or take. I can't help what I did as a fetus. I'm sorry. You took me from my apartment just to drive me back to my apartment. Breaking and entering isn't as fun if you know what's happening. I'm not an alcoholic. Your file says otherwise. Listen, you're an all right guy. Damn near human. We just want to fix you. I would have to be mentally broken or not already castrated for you to do that. I'm good. Oh, all right. How about you just open your Christmas present from this year? Oh boy, I hope it's a snake. What the fuck? Somebody shut him up with some duct tape. On it. What could possibly be wrong with me? You're, You're not, not an RPG, RPG guy. I thought that was my race. Nope, my bad. Got him mixed up.
Hey, good news. We're not getting charged with kidnapping. I just got off the phone with the government, and we're on good terms. Oh, tell them I said hi. You know what, Rex? How about you go? Uh, Scott's roommate of nine months. I think that makes sense. You're not my roommate. I thought you knew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what RPGs are. <laughs> but I think you're being a little bitch about them. Yeah, what are RPGs again? I don't know, a gun? Do I at least have a chance to explain myself? This is America, so no! This isn't America, this is Ohio! It all started 23 years ago, the doctor said. It's not an RPG fan. Contrary to popular belief, I didn't always play video games, which is why there are no records of me prior to 03. This was the year I truly started playing video games, so pretty much the year I was truly born, which you know what that means. I'm a minor. I remember my first experiences with the medium being in the arcade. You know, you go to the laundromat as a kid and you're a big fan of the dryer, but then as soon as you lay eyes on the Galaga in the corner, what well, the laundry fandom lost a member. The classics, Pac-Man, Ms. Pac-Man, Galaga, these were my favorites, so you know I'm fun at parties. My first video game experiences, and to this day, they're some of my most beloved titles. Sort of lame to say. Saying you love arcade games and your favorite is Pac-Man is like saying squares are my favorite boxes. Like, yeah, it's true, but who cares? It's such a basic answer. Anybody who hears you like arcade games wants to hear something more elaborate or obscure, but I'm not gonna say I give a shit about clacks for respect. I love those old Namco classics. They were and still are some of my favorite experiences. They're so simple and are pretty much the same song and dance every time you play them, but their gameplay never gets old. Around this time was when I discovered the Nintendo Entertainment System. It was hooked up at my grandma's house in the den area. I remember distinctly a goldfish cracker was lodged in the cartridge slot. Yeah, try it. It works. This was my cousin's old system and he left it there alongside a shoebox full of games. These are human teeth. Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. I easily played this one the most. Uh, keep in mind, I really f***ing hated ducks. Using the zapper gun was so cool and swapping over to Super Mario Brothers let me live out my fantasy of looking at sewage colored man. Super Mario Brothers 3 was there too. God, what a game. Every time I play it, I discovered something new. Holy shit. Excite Bike and Ninja Turtles 1 and 3 and Kung Fu Heroes and Adventures of Bayou Billy because there always has to be a seventh. But I didn't want to be a mooch, I wanted to be this. So I eventually received my other cousin's hand me down Sega Genesis Model 2. It came with a cartridge of Sonic the Hedgehog and I officially gave up on life. This opened a world of possibilities and closed another. I'm a video game owner now. Mom! Sonic the Hedgehog was the first standalone video game I ever owned. I played it so much I couldn't get past the second zone. Me personally, I blame the controller. Why did I always play with butter in my hands? Eventually for my birthday, I received a purple Game Boy Advance, my first brand new game system. The game I got with it? Sadly, this was after my butter phase. Licensed kids games were abundant and I played them for all they were worth. However, I also had Mario Kart Super Circuit, Yoshi's Island, Super Mario Advance 3, and Super Mario Advance 2 Super Mario World. This was my game. I played this to death. Until I get stuck at this one part where you finish a level and then the world map tells you to go f yourself. I love the world, the power ups, that sense of discovery. This was my first true video game love. Throughout that year, I got really into shapes, so for my next birthday, I got a GameCube alongside the Game Boy Player Attachment, letting me play all my Game Boy games on the TV. I mainly owned just licensed games for the console, but still adored it nonetheless. I had to go to my friend's house to play actual video games, like Pac-Man Fever. That Christmas, I received a blue Game Boy Advance SP and a colorblind diagnosis. A few years later, I snagged my cousin's PlayStation alongside a disc-only copy of Gran Turismo and the demo for Rascal. I didn't play this much. 2007, I got a Nintendo DS Lite, and by 2008, I got my Wii, and I played so much Wii Sports and Wii Play, Mario Galaxy, Smash Brothers, Brawl, GoldenEye 007, Mario Kart Wii, WarioWare Smooth Moves, alongside discovering my love for the history of gaming. I could download classic titles with this system, even the ones I played at my grandma's house. There was no need for her anymore. That was roughly my childhood gaming experience. After this, while I still received some game systems as gifts, I was a lot more conscious of the stuff I wanted. I wasn't as dependent on whatever my parents thought I might like. I knew I wanted a Wii U because it was better than wanting meth, but I, I didn't even scratch the surface of all the Nintendo 64 I played at others' houses, each and every game I owned and what they meant to me, how I played and couldn't get past the first level for dozens of hours of Frogger's Adventures on Game Boy Advance, a 40 minute long game. But hopefully this gave you a good idea as to what I was raised on, what games and consoles made me who I am today. Notice how Lufia 2 wasn't mentioned? As your therapist, I think it should be open to more things, like RPGs and murder. I've tried.
tried RPGs. And I've tried murder. It doesn't count till you like it. So what are RPGs again? Isn't it a political party in Guinea? Why are you so hell-bent on me being an RPG guy? You don't even know what RPGs are. Yeah, I do. Political party in Guinea. We've been over this. I always thought it was like a BLT, but for ranch peas and grapes. Well, why did you all give me Xenoblade? Well, that's an RPG. I didn't even know Xenoblade was pronounced like that. I thought we got you an enema. Yeah, I was wondering why you didn't shove this up your ass. No! Based on my childhood gaming experiences, it should be fairly obvious I enjoy more arcadey games. Now, what does that mean? Outside of me being wrong, well, it doesn't mean it has to be from the arcade, more so it retains elements of arcade gameplay. Look at Pac-Man, for example. I can all day. Quick reflexes, simple controls, easy to grasp concept, anybody can pick it up and play, but very few can master it. Have you seen professional Pac-Man players? No, they live in the Vatican. The concepts at play here really matter to me. If a game is like this at all, I'm gonna sleep well that night. This is probably why platforming is my favorite genre of gaming. You run and jump, it can't get much simpler than that. To anybody who has an argument against that, my mom never got Tetris. Pong? My grandma said, what the f is that? But with platformers, I mean, they would 100% not be able to play them well, but they at least understand what you're supposed to do and the objective. It's just like life. Get to the end. Running and jumping, there are an endless amount of things you can do with that. You can be a plumber, an evil plumber, a plumber's girlfriend. I value simplicity at face value, where like, oh, this is super easy to get, but when you dig deeper, you find all these elements that add up to the game being as good as it is. So just because my favorite genre is platformers doesn't mean I'll get sweaty for Leps World 2. No, you take games like Super Mario Galaxy, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Free, Sonic Mania, Mega Man X, Celeste, you start playing them and immediately you're like, I get it, I understand how to play, what to do, and why people give a shit. But then you start to notice amazing design details that went into all aspects of the gameplay, realizing, wow, this game is a masterclass of design. This affects that and that can't be there without this. That's what turns an already great game into a masterpiece. I love the pick up and play nature of platformers, how you get instant gratification when you jump. You're like, wow, I did that. When you defeat an enemy, when you just barely cross a gap, there's a rhythm to it all. It may be one of the most generic video game genres, like it's what I immediately think of when video game gets brought up, but I think it's for good reason. That doesn't mean I'm opposed to other genres. I love puzzle games for a lot of the same reasons. Rhythm games can be incredibly satisfying and addictive. Adventure games are a dream to get completely submerged in. Shooters I'm awful at, but they can be a blast. Get to the f***ing Xeno sh I don't like RPGs. Now, what is an RPG? Why would you ask me? Role-playing games are games where the player controls the actions of a character and slash or several party members immersed in some well-defined world. Oh. So, uh, what does that make me? An abuser. Technically speaking, this genre definition can be linked to pretty much most games regardless of genre. Take any game. You are controlling the actions of a character and are immersed in a well-defined world. The definition of an RPG can be a bit hazy. I've seen people call the f***ing economy an RPG. But you can't fool me. RPG is just like a cloud. I know one when I see it. Oh, th there's no debate. Let us go into some of the characteristics of traditional RPGs. Number one, elf sh Fantasy is generally the go-to genre of the genre. It kind of stems from the origins of video game RPGs, which were tabletop RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons. I'll stick to Yahtzee. Of course, an RPG can be set in any kind of world, but just like how puzzle games love the colored shape trope, fantasy is the go-to here. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some of my best friends are a fantasy. So what's the big deal? I love fantasy, put down three letters, I'm sold. Yeah, seems to me you don't have much of an argument here. Like Stalin. Stalin f***ing hated RPGs but love Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so we're, I'm we're, into we're, it. We're on the same page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense. But, absolutely. Yeah, I get it. But, I get it good now. Point. Good point. Better point. Yeah. Better point. Yeah. Better point. Yeah. 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 It's not Link Smash Geist or Burnout Crash. Not Mario Party 6 or Ultra Smash. Neither Clubhouse Games or Wii Fit Plus. Nor Family Feud on SNES. All the games I play, whether good or bad, have tropes in common. My favorite team, Dad. It may be rushed or plain or flawed, but they ain't RPGs. Oh, thank God. Are my tastes just bad? Am I the one to blame? Or is it RPGs that are dumb and lame? No. Why don't you play them? They just take so damn long to complete. Why don't you play them? 60 hours just to rinse and repeat. But you could cry for years just to feed that myself. Why waste all this time on just one game? Why don't you play them? I just don't like them! I just wanna play stupid Nintendo games! That aren't this stupid! But why don't I like them? Okay. Turf-based battles in too much text. I'd rather be out not having sex. Menu clutter and useless stats. And random encounters can kiss my ass. No gameplay till hours in. Combat ready? How did I win? Same thing happens over again. 
And that their fun part comes up when? I missed one thing and now I'm lost. That one inch of text really meant a lot. There's some shop with items I can't afford. So grab for money, you won't be bored. I'm tired, I'm scared, I'm not having fun. There's no other way this can be spun. What do I do? What do I check? It's an RPG. What did I expect? Listen, guys. You can't have opinions. Why don't you play the They're not my style. Why don't you play the Why don't you play the Why don't you Number two, wait your turn, f***. The de facto setup for RPGs most think of is the turn-based RPG. I don't want to wait to be disappointed. This isn't a pregnancy. So let's look at how a turn-based RPG works. You're exploring this vast world and experiencing a story as it unfolds. That's the point of most RPGs, to create a universe that you want to get lost in. Tell a story unlike any other with some of the most memorable characters out there. This is why video games are such a popular medium to tell stories through. You are a character. This story is happening to you. Your friends in the game start to feel real if it's done right. Most role-playing games heavily depend on an engaging story, and of course stories need conflict, so what happens when danger strikes? Well, I'm walking around enjoying myself, thinking, what's next? Homicide. Here's a list of things I can do. I can attack, I usually perform some special ability like existence. Well, that didn't do a damn thing. Or just give up, run, bitch out, they don't care. So I select what I want to do, I watch the character do what I told them to do, uh, then it's the enemy's turn, because it's only fair. They attack. Thanks. And now we're back to me. Uh, I'll probably attack again. Actually, it might be a good time to heal myself with some medicine. Uh, good, I brought Dayquil. Uh, all right, and it's their turn again. They attack. And now we're back to me again. All right. Obviously, there's nothing inherently wrong with turn-based battles. It's a time-tested gameplay style. If it was completely outdated and uninteresting, it would have been ripped out of games eons ago. There's a reason text-based adventure games died out and their technology is being reused on Tinder. We still get turn-based battles in games constantly. They obviously work. There is depth here, and most video game players like them. The biggest media franchise on the planet is Pokemon, and it's a turn-based RPG. It works. But want to see why Scott's a f***ing idiot? I can see it! So the point of a role-playing game is to make me feel as if I'm playing a role. If I'm supposed to be immersed as this character, why are battles set up like this? This is potentially the worst way to immerse me in an experience. When would my mortal enemy bat number four wait for me to pick an attack and then let her rip? Why would I give them a chance to hurt me? That's just counterproductive! And going through my list of attacks I can perform, it doesn't make me feel like I'm the one performing them. It feels like I'm commanding that character to do it. Turn-based combat almost feels at odds with the rest of what these games are trying to do. If it's trying to make me feel as if I am the character, going to the extent of having me name them myself, why are the battles like puppet shows? Well, I guess you could view RPGs as a performance. The origins of tabletop RPGs, you announce everything you're doing as if it's a book being written right there on the spot. So there's some showmanship to it all. It's a role-playing game. So it's like these are actors taking on the roles of these characters. So again, why can I name this guy myself if I'm playing the role of him? Most of the time, the actor doesn't pick the character's name. I just don't feel like I'm doing anything in these battles. Clicking through a menu doesn't feel like I'm accomplishing anything, and landing a great attack... I just don't feel incredibly accomplished. I selected a menu option. I'll play Pac-Land for that, thank you. Taking turns just slowed things down so much. Like, what is he waiting for? Just shoot me! To be fair, I mean, it does offer strategy. You have to sit and think sometimes. Like, hmm, how do I want this man to gut me? Not every game should have action-packed combat. It's good to have options. I just f***ing hate this one. Out of all the games to have a ton of enemy encounters, why do RPGs have them the most? They go on forever, and there's a million of them you have to go through all against the same enemies over and over again. Think of everything you could do with all that time. Nope, I got nothing. And then there's the fact that many of these games have random encounters. All right, here we are, number three. Oops! Oh good, I try to make my way from point A to point B, but I'll randomly be forced to partake in a battle. I don't even see the enemies when I run into them. Like, what's the context of this happening? Oh wow, here I am. Hey. Sure, it keeps you on your toes, but it's like, how often do I have to be on my toes? Man, this is painful. It's like, yeah, it's a surprise. You always have to be ready for a battle, but on your way to a location, you can expect at least two or three random battles thrown in there. So at that point, it's not a surprise. I'm expecting it. Did these need to happen? Do they make the game better? No! But to be fair, lots of non-RPGs have random enemy placements that don't need to be there. Like, I could give a shit about your Goomba placement. But these random encounters happen out of nowhere. You don't even see where the enemies are. You just randomly get thrown 
thrown into a battle, you can easily avoid this. And when you're in the battle itself, it takes just as long as any standard battle in the game. Battles that are required for progression. Well, it's more fun to get shot by surprise than to know ahead of time. Well, I guess random encounters are here because another big element of RPGs are experience points. Leveling your character up from string cheese weak to being stronger than any being. I can do anything now. I can... Stomach playing Final Fantasy. Number four, feeling like you did something today. Having a visual indication of just how much stronger you get after each and every battle is unbelievably satisfying. I think experience points or EXP make RPGs for people. You know just how long it takes to go through a whole battle with an ant. And that ant can kick your ass like it puts up a fight. But then a few hours in, you level up and you're more powerful. You can one shot kill those ants. Character development. I'm now better than ants. But you know what you have to do in so many of these games? You have to grind for your experience experience points. You have to wander around, get into random encounters, and just win a bunch of battles to level up before you progress. Of course, most of the time, you don't have to, but it's kinda necessary if you don't want to stain the carpet with your decapitated head. Grinding almost feels like I'm exploiting the game sometimes. Like, is this really how the game was designed? For me to walk around in circles for two hours doing nothing but getting into random battles fighting weak enemies to gain extra experience? I just killed snails for 20 minutes. I'm ready to take on Satan. I think we have some more to say. Target employee? <clears throat> He works at Target? Oh yeah, big time. I love his work. Did you see how stock the shelves were today? Oh yeah, I saw how stock the shelves were today. Oh uh, yeah, Scott, you mostly knew my brother. He worked at Wendy's. He was a really good guy, mostly dead nowadays. Didn't he work at Wendy's? <laughs> He's talking. His dying wish was to see you play near replicant version 1.224744. I think he was having a seizure. See, we, we care about you, man. My foot's turning purple. See, you lock yourself out of so many experiences saying you're not an RPG guy. That's the oldest excuse in the book. Gets me out of jury duty. What else am I supposed to say? Why, yes, please. I'll take one, sweep it, and four. My parents met over that one. What about the stories of these games? That's why you play them. So here we have number five. Incredible, engaging, long-winded, weird-as-hell plots. Video games can house some of the greatest tales ever told, and it seemed like RPGs were the only way to tell those kind of stories years ago. And I think there's a clear reason to make a story into a video game compared to just a movie or a book. It's the experience. There are tons of video game stories that are great. They would blow as a film. The stories of many iconic RPGs play out almost like they're a 4,000 page novel with stupid haircuts. Oh, and you have to do the same thing 400 times. A lot of these stories are great with huge moments of emotion. Character deaths mean more because when you're doing turn-based battles, you often have multiple party members. If one of them died, it stings that much more. It can be so much more effective than other mediums to tell a story. But then you have the other side of RPGs where I can't take this seriously. I am a prince talking to a mechanic. Okay. I thought I'd uh, adjust my speech here. Scott, the lack of RPGs you play is horrifying, and I've seen bees. Oh, he means it. To show how much we care, I have a surprise witness. At an intervention? I present to you K Swiss of Bankruptcy Patrol. Oh my god, you got a white guy? This is Scott's bank account without RPGs. Sure, he's buying them, but he's spending all his time playing and buying other games. If he sat down and played an RPG, he wouldn't have time to waste money on other games. Well, at least I'm stimulating the economy. If anything, you're doing immense damage to the economy. You're buying plenty of RPGs, but you have no actual interest in them. Companies think you want RPGs, so they make more, but when more RPGs are announced, you get annoyed and tell people not to play them. Without this issue, people who actually want to play RPGs buy them. Thus, supply and demand return to a renaissance, if you will. We call this issue the Scottless economy. With you actually playing RPGs, we call it an economy. You son of a bitch, I love the economy! Now we have one of the big ones. Number six, these games never f***ing end. Oh my god, why do these take so long? Role-playing games are generally on the longer side of things. At the least, they can usually run you 20 hours from start to finish. As somebody who really just wants to experience as many video games as possible, why would I want to play one 50-hour game when I could play five 10-hour ones? I know many want games to be as long as possible. I saw people complain how Final Fantasy VII Remake was only 30 hours. My weekend's 48 hours, what am I going to do with that extra 18? I don't know, I personally get a little turned off when I hear how long a game is. I've never been a big, I better be able to squeeze this many hours out of a game kind of guy. But I totally understand if people are like that, it's just... I don't care if a game's 10 hours, that sounds like a pretty sweet length to me. But RPGs are so long because they have so many battles, and so many of those battles are the same things over and over again. It's just the amount of time I spend in these games, I don't feel it's justified. And then we have number seven. 
Sensory overload. What the f*** am I looking at? Is this really the least complicated that could have made this menu look? I want to get the Black Desert menu on my back. These games have such thick ass menu systems with some menus and some menus and tutorials on how to use the menus and honestly fairly unnecessary user interfaces that overcomplicate what could be a simple and intuitive experience. I think I have something to say here. Yeah, I do too. That's it. I feel like you're really blocking yourself from experiences that will truly better your life and outlook on art as a whole. I wrote this when I thought we were still talking about guns. Okay, and what do you think about role-playing games? Oh, just don't be a bitch. It is your place. <laughs> yeah, I got a RPG delivery. Jeb, yeah, why didn't you come earlier? Well, I work today. I love the economy. <laughs> Oh, I deliver RPGs to at-risk youth. So they're going to be RPG guys. Here. This, this is Madden. Yeah. No. No. Ah! Anybody want to rent the second room here? What are you all RPGs too? RPGs can be anything. I was talking to someone and they f***ing catfished me. I've been only talking about turn-based RPGs, but what about action RPGs, strategy RPGs, MMO RPGs, JRPGs, which is just if a role-playing game is made in Japan. That's it. Action RPGs are like, take out the turns and just make them just normal fights. Oh, hit this button to attack. Oh, oh, thank God. I gotta say though, a lot of action RPGs just feel like hack and slashes or shooters with numbers. MMO RPGs, let's take this and pair it up with Omegle. Look at these players online. These are my type of people. We all know how to use menus. Strategy RPGs, I got nothing. These are all such different types of games and so many games outside of RPGs have RPG elements. You can make an argument that any one of these games are RPGs. Madden, look at all these stats. How is this not an RPG? People constantly make the argument Zelda's an RPG. Sure, keep telling yourself that. It has RPG elements, pretty much any of the sins I mentioned and then some. I give up. I lost. I guess I have to become an RPG guy because if I don't, I can't enjoy anything. Leap year this year. It's December. Oh, food's here. What is this? They're ribs. I thought we were getting a corn dog. These are nature's corn dogs. I can't eat ribs. I'm not hungry. I am vegan. Oh, come on. Somebody has to. I ordered the economy size. <laughs> Let's start with a few that started it all. Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. Dragon Quest or Dragon Warrior originally over here in America. Playing this now, it is so simple and basic, but there's a charm to it. And many of the systems we see in RPGs today, they're here in full force. It's weird to say a game like this has aged well, because it hasn't. But when you put it side by side to modern RPGs, you start to notice more similarities and differences. Dragon Quest has always been an RPG staple, primarily in Japan. Over here, it's not as celebrated. Come on, this is America. I like Mickey Mouse and f***ing my wife. But Dragon Quest has always been there. I'm surprised how many people I've run into who immediately recognizes the slime enemy from the series. The spin-offs are all over the place, like Dragon Quest Swords on Wii, which is pretty much a Dragon Quest game, played in first person with a ton of automated movement and motion control combat. You just swipe away at the enemies, and overall, it feels like a Dragon Quest game for a f***ing idiot. I love it. But of course, we have Dragon Quest XI S Echoes of an Elusive Age Definitive Edition. Number eight, ass long titles. Oh my God, this game is so lovely. Like it's just so happy. Even when dark moments happen, this is just such a jolly world. These characters designs are so fun. I'm not a fan of more typical anime-esque designs, but with Dragon Quest, I like the style. It just feels so nice. The characters, the monsters, even the gameplay. I'm sure the battles are more tedious than if it wasn't a traditional RPG, but it's not that annoying. I like this game. I just don't want to spend a hundred hours liking it. But then we have Final Fantasy, easily the most iconic RPG series. While Dragon Quest was far more traditional in terms of fantasy world with dragons, beat the evil, Final Fantasy continues to go all over the place. Again, this is a prince. Each Final Fantasy is pretty much completely separate from the last, which is how we get such game titles as Final Fantasy 13 too. The Final Fantasy game I played the most is Final Fantasy 7 Remake. I like it, but man, like I said, action RPGs just don't feel like RPGs to me. They feel like hack and slash games with stats. The series hasn't always been turn-based, and that's not even counting junk like spin-offs. Final Fantasy 11 and 14 are MMORPGs. 
Am I the only one to find that bizarre that mainline number titles in the Final Fantasy series are MMOs? Like, why not make them their own designated spin-off series like Final Fantasy Online, but... All right. 15 and 7 Remake are action RPGs. No turns here. This was done to give Final Fantasy more broad appeal and make it so a FIFA fan could play it. So I gotta be honest, I have a lot more fun with this gameplay style, but I almost feel patronized playing it like I'm too dumb to enjoy the older games, so here's some flashier bullshit. Yeah, is this uh, stale pretzels? I'd like to place an order. Yeah, the stale pretzels. Oh, oh, get some ribs. No, it's stale pretzels. All they have are... Stale pretzels. No, if you ask, they'll make it for you. Yeah, I'll do a side of pretzels. It's kind of a weird way to say ribs. My god, is this how we sounded to him? Depends on how he pronounces ribs. Of course, if you're more of a classic RPG guy, there are still tons of games releasing that are supposed to be direct callbacks to those older games. Bravely Default and Octopath Traveler. If you're not a fan of modern Final Fantasy, these games bring us back to a simpler, far slower time. Yeah, I'm not as into this. When you program a fast forward button into the base game, I feel like you could have just designed the gameplay to be more efficient. But God, Octopath, there isn't any other game that looks quite like this. And the music! Kingdom Hearts answers the age old question of what would happen when you put Final Fantasy and Disney together. Actually, I don't know if it does or not. And all these games come courtesy of Square Enix, your one-stop shop for RPGs. They've also released other iconic titles like Chrono Trigger and the Mana series, which is interesting considering it was one of the few classic RPGs that went for an action approach comparative to turn-based. While I highly disagree on The Legend of Zelda being an RPG, at least one entry in the series is definitely one. Zelda 2: The Adventure of Link. You kill enemies to level yourself up in various departments. I like it. Zelda 2 gets a lot of flag, but it's honestly pretty enjoyable. And Nintendo's RPG series, I mean, we have the Mother series, or Earthbound, which has definitely helped many get into RPGs. Most games of this nature were fantasy, which has its fans, but Earthbound, you were playing as a kid in a town. It made it stand out, and I think it helped many find more of an attachment with the genre. Now, Pokemon, on the other hand, can fuck right off. I've tried so many times, but I just can't get into Pokemon. I feel like I've 100% missed the boat on playing the franchise. If I played it as a kid, I feel like I'd find it easier to enjoy now. If I start the game, I just feel like it's a slog. I don't feel this sense of wonder. I just feel like I'm walking from point A to point B, mashing the A button to get through text boxes, fighting other Pokemon by, again, mashing the A button. At least turn base works really well here in terms of immersion. You're not the Pokemon, you're commanding them what to do, which I think works much better contextually than most other RPGs. I want to like these games though. I just can't get into them. Same with the Xenoblade series. I'm so happy that this franchise went from not coming outside of Japan to here's a Smash Brothers character, multiple remasters and remakes, a sequel, another sequel, an expansion to the sequel. It's really cool to see that and I think the original Xenoblade is unbelievably impressive. Like this world is in a Wii game. It's just not personally really my thing. But then you have Golden Sun. Definitely gives me Dragon Quest feelings of happiness. I do like a lot about this. But then you have the beginner RPGs from Nintendo, based on the Mario franchise. Super Mario RPG, Mario & Luigi, Paper Mario, many of these games actually make turn-based combat fun. They have action commands, which means, hey, pick an attack, then time your action just right by hitting a button at this exact moment. It's almost like a rhythm game, it keeps me involved and entertained. Sure, some of the games are dog shit, but I think these games help tremendously in conveying the appeal of RPGs to those who don't play a ton of them. No matter how much you enjoy role-playing games, you have to admit, they aren't the easiest to jump into most of the time. You gotta wean yourself on a Mario RPG before you jump into Persona 5. Holy f This game is so stylish and cool! Listen to the music! The setting is so neat! I think I've become an RPG guy! And I f***ing hate myself! What am I? What have I become? I don't even use one of these! Ah! Oh! Hello, my name is God. Oh my god, I meet Jesus and a Target employee in the same week? You know, we should we should do something nice for him. I'd like to place a fling smash order? What do I want? <coughs> yeah, I'll go with fling smash this time. <coughs> Christ, it's been a busy day for us. Two deliveries? This economy is about to be the f***ing best. So I thought you just delivered RPGs. Well, RPG can mean a lot of different things. For example, like when you're really playing Gex. Hey kid, do you want a Gex? No, no, no. I have to pay for it. God, I wanna f*** the economy. I just wanted to give you a formal warning on your recent performance as a human. You're really f***ing it. I don't wanna f*** anything! What did I do wrong? First off, that time you drank that water and made a face, f*** you. 
I make water. Second off, you're trying to be an RPG guy. I thought that's what everybody wanted! See, I crafted humanity to have the instinctive trait to not like RPGs. So that's why cavemen never played them. Then all of a sudden, evolution was like, F*** you, here's Ogre Battle 64, person of lordly caliber, the famous game that everybody loves, and ever since we've had a bunch of mutants walking around playing RPGs. So it's normal to not like RPGs? It's normal to not like all kinds of things, whether it's RPGs or murder. You never would have known. Scott, Bubby, you know who you are and what you like and don't like. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not an RPG guy. You know this deep down, but that doesn't mean you should immediately denounce every RPG that you come across. Even though RPGs were never meant to be enjoyed, people liked them for some reason. You should respect and understand that as much as they should respect and understand you. But even if you generally don't like something, giving it a try from time to time can open your eyes to great experiences you would have never had otherwise. Can I add you on LinkedIn? I think I get it. I'm not an RPG guy! And sharks are just sexy fish at the end of the day. RPGs are my go-to genre, and that's okay, just like how everybody doesn't like platformers or sports games or first-person shooters or party games. My criticisms of RPGs were just opinions. They're the same reasons why people love RPGs, and that's okay! But that doesn't mean I can never like RPGs. I really like Dragon Quest and some Final Fantasy games I like, and I'm just really happy that Xenoblade's doing well, and Persona 5 is really cool. No, I'm going too far. This. 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 This, 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 this. Hey all, Scott here. I'm not an RPG guy and I'm proud of who I am. No RPG is ever gonna make me anything otherwise.
Halloween. It's my favorite time of year. Wednesday? No, 8 p.m. Thanks for decorating with me. You never hear of a therapist that's willing to help their patient. As long as we're still on the clock, I don't mind. Wait, well, hey, since you're already here, guess who is your secret Santa? Oh, I hate riddles. Please guess I put money on your answer. Well, if I guess right, it wouldn't be a secret. Please, it was me. Well, I don't know any me's. I know a you. Well, he was your secret Santa. F it, I don't need my toes anyway. Oh, how did my secret Santa know? Well, when you asked for water when you came in, I knew it would be perfect. I love it. Don't patent that reaction years because I'm gonna create a sequel tonight. I've been trying to figure out who got me for Secret Santa for nine years, which says a lot about my dedication considering invitations went out a week ago. See, when we were passing the hat around drawing everybody's names for Secret Santa, I recorded everybody's facial expressions. Jeb's eye twitched, and his eye only twitches when he sees the letter B, which eliminates me and everybody else. Why do you want to know so badly? I already got my present, and I don't even know who got me. Well, I'm planning this to be the best Christmas ever. We'll make a new Jesus. A better Jesus. A Jesus for the common man. That, and I want everybody to get exactly what they wanted for Christmas, which includes me. Again with this me guy. You know, he was my secret Santa. I just want a good quality present, something that tells me everybody around me truly cares. But you got an intervention last year. Yeah, but I've been thinking through a lot lately. Like, just yesterday, I was reminiscing about the lamest possible presents. Fertility? Hey y'all, Scott here. You know, I've been on a pretty good streak this year of not having any major injuries. But I still have a balance up to my hospital gift card, so it's just a little shovel to the head. Nothing beats learning your relatives don't know a single thing about you by getting a gift card. Oh, I got you a gas card because I happen to notice that you seem to love to drive to work every day. We all enter that phase when we become hard to shop for, which in reality means nobody loves you enough to think critically for a second. I've been told I'm hard to shop for. How? My hobby couldn't be more blatant. I just don't know what to get him! Jeans. As a 24 year old guy, being told I'm hard to shop for just means I know you don't like sports, so I bought you Axe Body Spray. Like, come on, you can't play this on a ColecoVision. See, but I did this to myself. After years of actual presence as a child, I entered my apathetic phase because I thought I was really fing cool. I mustn't dare tell my family I like video games. I don't want them to look at me like some kind of nerd. So I generally kept to myself about my sheer interest in video games. I was watching gameplay of New Super Mario Bros. Wii online, and when my dad came in, I immediately hid the window and looked up porn. But when do you get the teenager who refuses to tell you about their actual interests? Gift cards! Buy your own present, you f***ing creep. Oh, these are THE thing to get if you're terrified of telling people what you really want for Christmas. Very interesting phenomenon. The gift card is seemingly a psychological trick. One where the gift giver feels like they actually bought the gift givee a gift. Uh, when in reality, you severely limited their options. Just give them cash. Instead, you're telling them, I don't want you to pay your bills, I want you to go to Fazoli's. Hey, I'm guilty of it too, both wanting gift cards and giving them. Just regular cash is more useful, but a gift card gets your mind going as to what you could buy with it. Being more limited forces you to think outside the box, to treat yourself with the money rather than just pocket the cash and use it on a toll booth or something. Which, as a teenage boy, a popular gift card to get me was of the gaming variety. Gift cards and gaming are all over the place, and most notably when it comes to digital storefronts. A Wii points card, your ticket to cruising through the Wii shop channel to buy some old school classics or get ripped off of some WiiWare game. But did you ever realize just how wasteful the packaging for this was originally? Like it's a card. Why do you not only need it in a paper sleeve, but surrounded by bulletproof plastic? When the rhinos go extinct, we know who to blame. I will never get over the trend of fake currency during this era. Uh, Wii points, I will always understand. Uh, just remove the decimal from the dollar amount, you got yourself a Wii points to USD conversion tool. Microsoft points freak me me out. How does this work? These old digital store card designs have so much more charm than they do now, uh, which is the opposite of what went on with Nintendo. <laughs> look at the Xbox 360 points card you could buy. Like, if you were a kid, there's always something new to look at and read on the car ride home. I was like, this upcoming generation is Oh, they didn't get shapes on their Xbox card. But Nintendo, the inverse happened. The old school Wii Shop Channel cards were unbelievably bland. Watch out behind you, there's a happy couple playing Wario's Woods. Later, they released Nintendo DSi Shop Channel cards before combining them to be Nintendo Points cards, then Nintendo eShop cards for the 3DS, Wii U, and now we get cards with characters' faces on them. Which, this is far more appealing. I mean, it's a little messed up how Nintendo is ranking their characters' worth. Donkey Kong is $99. Is that his fixed rate? They have a gift card for every amount over a Nintendo. How many of you bought the $5 one? I really had an itch for Bouncy Bob and 
bouncy bob four more times. But you know what was the coolest thing about gift cards for a while? What GameStop did with them. They sold exclusive gift card holding tins based on game consoles, which I always found adorable. Apparently nobody else did. These were pennied out. This wheat tin? I mean, if it didn't actually sell for a penny, that's a problem with society, not the tin. This is really cool. It makes it so you have something to actually open, like a like a present. Uh, then you have a cool little collectible to put on your shelf afterwards. Uh, the gift card is nestled in here. Okay, that just looks kind of gross. I think the Nintendo DS Lite tin steals the show though. You open it up and it shows screenshots from Phantom Hourglass and fake little buttons. This is really in depth for such a superfluous item. Not all of them can be winners though. The Wii U gamepad gift card tin. I might as well just give your son this. It's just a regular tin with a Wii U gamepad design printed onto it. Uh, not nearly as cool as the others here, but it's at least a neat enough design. The other tins do take some liberties with some dimensions while the gamepad is fairly true to form. Like look at those areolas. And God bless Nintendo for having system designs that work as gift card tins. Because without them, we're fucked. The Xbox One X gift card tin. Now, you may be saying, well, Scott, this is supposed to be a miniature version of the console's box because everybody remembers the Xbox One X box. Iconic moments in gaming. Outside of the tins, there are a few other cool things done with gift cards. Uh, one I remember was the Photos with Mario collection of Nintendo eShop cards for the 3DS. These would double as not only eShop cards, but AR cards you could use with a free downloadable 3DS application. Uh, you can pose and play around with some Mario models. It was a really cool inclusion that Nintendo never needed to do. Like, think about it. This was one of the lower points in the company's history with the Wii U's failure and right after having to cut the 3DS's price point. So what does Nintendo do? The exact opposite of making money. These cost the exact same as any other eShop card. So you'd be a fool not to get the photos with Mario edition. You idiot! So it's like Nintendo put that much more effort into selling eShop cards and made no extra money off of it, but hey, I'm sure they sold a few more eShop cards this way. I can't imagine a ton, but it was a cool little thing to collect. Though AR cards on the 3DS aren't anything special. Uh, they're printed on regular paper, so you can just bring up the image on your phone and it has the same effect in the 3DS app. They did versions of this for Animal Crossing and Pikmin as well, though those didn't release in North America. I guess they know we're just more into not deals over here. Well, these days, gift cards, aren't as fun. Look at the ones on display right now. We have the in-game currency gift cards. If you know all your son wants is Madden points, you could ask for anything this Christmas. So you did. Oh man, a Fortnite gift card? That's a weird way to spell Roblox. And that's a weird way to spell Roblox. The game specific ones, cards that give you the codes to specific games, which often aren't on the cards themselves. They get printed on your receipt upon purchase, which what's the point of the card when you have to include the receipt? Just buy $60 worth of store credit. You ever wonder how they choose which games to offer as digital copy cards? I think about it. They f up a tree for this. Then of course we have the normal everyday store cards, which make the most sense to me. I don't have much of a reason at all to buy gift cards for myself anymore, as when you get to a certain age, you just use your credit card on these services, unless you're really paranoid. But man, these were so much more fun. Now it's like, oh great, Act Razor Renaissance came out. Let me waste my money on it. With only a $20 gift card, you had to really think it through. It made every purchase on the Wii Shop Channel or Xbox Live Arcade that much more exciting. This was your choice. Many times I go for as many games as possible. I could get four NES games for 2,000 Wii points or two Nintendo 64 games or a few WiiWare titles. And being limited made each purchase that much more special. It was so much fun to pick these up at the store and excitingly rush to the console to input the code and browse for hours figuring out what to buy. Of course now I can buy whatever I want, damn it. Watch this. You think somebody happy could do that? But sometimes less is more. It really makes you appreciate the little things as a kid. You know, while there were limitations, it made you appreciate the smallest things. Gaming gift cards were a joy to get back then. Now it's like, come on, you didn't just know I wanted Sackboy? But even though they're not as exciting or useful to me now, I will always treasure the thought of getting a Microsoft points card and the dread that came with converting it. I think I finally figured out the formula. So 1600 Microsoft points equals Solve for V-Bucks? What the f*** is that?! That'll help me with your sessions moving forward. Thanks for recounting your trauma with me. I was talking about gaming gift cards. <laughs> yeah! They have feet, right? Oh, lots. Then that must be them. Listen, help me figure out who my secret Santa is. I can't wait. If you really couldn't wait, your hands would be far bloodier. Hey, Merry Christmas. Here's your work cited. Damn, he's right. I can't believe I was finally able to buy a white guy with dark hair a secret Santa present. Write that down. You guys, 
Something crazy happened on the way here. I walked over water. You mean the frozen pond? I'm not saying I'm Jesus. I'm saying I'm Jesus Christ. Anybody giving off major they got Scott a gift vibes? That depends. Are those vibes stinky? Sure. Stink much? You get work off for the holidays? Nope. Uh-oh. Don't worry. I forgive you. So you really think you're the reincarnation of Christ, huh? Yes. Oh man, I hear words. What are they? <laughs> Let's just say if your name's Satan, you don't want to know. Wow. What do you call those things? Gifts. Who are they for? Mine's for somebody. Frankly, a person whose name stands out of a crowd. Some of the best vowel and consonant uses I've ever seen. Well, that narrows it down. Nope, not stinky enough. You don't have the vibes. Yeah, I've been taking some supplements. So you didn't get Scott? No, I got Target employee, but whoever wrote his name misspelled it with a B. Of course, nobody has time to use G's anymore. So what, you're trying to figure out who got Scott for Secret Santa? Is it really that obvious? Well, maybe we can think of all the types of things Scott might have got, shake all the presents and figure out which one sounds like it's the most for him. No, what if somebody's gifted us a rat? Oh, I won't be caught dead shaking a rat. So we agree this is a stupid idea, which leaves us with plan B. Well, seriously though, what kind of stuff would Scott want? Maybe we can ask the guys and see what they've been buying recently. You know, he has a whole tape about this stuff. Hey all Scott here. What do I want for Christmas? For some tree to get absolutely f***ed up. That works. What the f*** do I do? That's where the holiday gift guides come in. These giant fat books. Like oink oink Mr. Cow. You ever have a really hard time figuring out what to get somebody you should know inside and out by now? Like how do you not know your dad's shoe size? Well these books are here to help. Bingo. As a kid, your natural instinct was to thumb through these catalogs with an ass red pen and make sure mom knows damn well your priorities. It's so much easier this way because how often do you know off the top of your head everything you need? A septic tank. Having I nearly everything sellable right in front of your face definitely helps, but that's considering what these guides were like back when they were new. Now, they're straight up time capsules. This is the oldest one I own from the holiday season of 1983, the video game Christmas guide. Let's see, they suggest the Magnavox Odyssey 2, okay the Odyssey 2, the Odyssey 2, and the Odyssey 2. I think this fits the term propaganda well. Who do you think you are calling a Magnavox Odyssey 2 at a video game gift guide? None of those words apply! This released just a year before the Odyssey 2 was discontinued, so I'm sure they cheaped out on staples by going with this folder-esque design, but in all honesty, this is pretty cool. It gives you the opportunity to turn any of these pages into posters. Pop this on your wall, blast some metal, and tell mom to off. The next oldest one I own is actually from Japan. This one is a part of the long-running Japanese magazine, Weekly Famitsu. Released in November of 1991 and covers Famicom, Super Famicom, and Game Boy releases. Yeah, English may be my first language, but Japanese is tied for second along with all the other languages I don't know. Of course, taking into consideration the fact I can't read any of this, at the very least, thumbing through and seeing all the pictures is somewhat appealing. I mean, it's kind of cool to think there was a time when Hattress was just coming out. Seeing screenshots of Famicom and Game Boy games that are so obviously just taken with a camera off screen is really charming. When I was a kid, that's how I would have put together a video game magazine in Microsoft Office or something. So it's really cool to see actual professionals use more amateurish techniques, even if it's only because that's all they could really do at the time. Now, I will reiterate. What? I can't read any of this, so let's dumb it down a notch. This right here is probably what many will think of when hearing Holiday Gift Guide, the Sears Catalog, this one being from 1992. What's Sears, you may ask? I'll answer that by asking, what's Kmart? Sears was a department store, the most popular for a while. They sold pretty much everything, but I don't know. Something about the logo made me think all they sold was car parts. But no, if this wish book is anything to go by, they did it all. They're still around now with a softer logo that makes it feel more like a Macy's. That's gotta be plagiarism. But their prominence is greatly reduced compared to their peak years. Not nearly as many stores, barely anybody talks about them, and it's pissing me off. I'm going to Sears! These wish books covered 
everything. As in, here's the cover show kissing children telling Santa what they want. Lingerie. Collegeopoly, what kind of jerks can't get the Monopoly license? For style points, they include NES games and accessories in with this listing for crew necks and cargoes because I'd like to see you play Metroid and anything, but they like this because it shows how everything was back in 1992, not just video games. Pants were different back then. Or how novelty fish merch was just getting started. A personal tanning bed for $2,500? I already own a flashlight. This counts. <laughs> Ha! Grooming kits for kids! It's not what you think! Yeah, they were doing play shaving kits with Batman and Ninja Turtles licensing, which makes things better. This came from Batman. Oh, a Barbie party bake oven. That's just an easy bake oven, you coward. You know, I always wanted an easy bake oven as a kid. I mean, why wouldn't I? I could make cake whenever I wanted. But of course, the boy version was called the queasy bake oven and only had gross sounding recipes because obviously no boy would ever want to make brownies. Oh, hell yeah, the little computers for kids? Yeah, this one looks pretty high tech, all things considered. We spent 50 bucks on this thing and all he's typing is horse. The hell, they had gamer chairs all the way back then? I thought those were invented in the mid 2000s to keep the Xbox fans down. I have back problems and play Halo. That's just too much. Character sleeping bags, out of all of these, why would you pick the car that's half shown or the rollerbladers? I wanna be inside that. The photos here are quite impressive considering that pretty much every product has kind of an elaborate photo shoot set up. Like, look at these toys, all having thematically appropriate backgrounds and terrain. For an era without Photoshop, this is really cool. A rector. <laughs> yep, he agrees. I <laughs> even have collectibles, autographs, sports, and pop culture memorabilia. I just flat out wouldn't expect that from a department store. Oh my god, a gumball machine for only 20 bucks? I would have lost my mind at that as a kid. I love this kind of garbage, like it would make my bedroom feel like a Fazoli's. Entire box sets of comic books, pool, air hockey, and foosball tables, board games, miniature at-home plastic pinball games, which I own this Mario 64 one as a kid. Speaking of which, we're finally at the video game portion of the wish book. Uh, you know, this thing goes all over the place. I'm not sure how they're organizing it. It's like, here's a section for kids, then here's underwear, mom. Well, firstly, we got the Game Boy front and center here alongside LCD games by Konami. Only 20 bucks a pop, but the actual Game Boy games themselves, not bad, only around 30. I always love this Game Boy carrying case. That looks just like a Game Boy. But weirdly enough, no screenshots of games for the handheld. While well, on the next page for the Atari Lynx and second Game Gear, we get nothing but Bill and Ted, time-traveling righteous dudes on a wacky adverb the turbo duo was three hundred dollars moving on right in the middle of the sega genesis and super nintendo rivalry with images of sonic and mario front and center the mario artwork looks ripped from the japanese manga series sonic well they use the japanese design compared to the north american one this book is just flat out fun to look through i mean i think everybody gets a kick out of just looking at toys look you can be nickelodeon but there's so much here that i feel like vintage sears wish book should be held to a higher standard these days historians should scoop these up and treasure them as nothing else will give you a better indication of what was going on this year than this. But the wish book covers everything. Uh, what about something a bit more fine-tuned? This right here is an electronics boutique catalog from holiday 1994. Yikes, 96 pages? You're weak. Literally half of this entire catalog is PC software, which hey, at least old school PC games had some of the coolest boxes. Since they weren't restricted to a standardized format, they could do trapezoids, tombstones, or just out there graphic designs like front page sports or or the bicycle pack of playing cards for this collection of PC card games. These Street Fighter series include Street Fighter 1 and 2, plus bonus Mega Man 1 and 3. Well then this package is just as much Mega Man as it is Street Fighter, what the hell? Jesus, $30 for screensavers? Like how is this the same price as Dr. Ruth's Encyclopedia of Sex? And why is Seinfeld more expensive than both? Contains all the information you and your family need to be sexually literate in the 90s. Any other decade, you're f or you're not getting f***ed, I guess. So make your way to American Dream Calendar Girl screensaver. This is a tough decision. Bro, metal and lace contains violence and sexy graphics? Is that a warning or a selling point? Looking for something fun and exciting yet sexier than munching dots or pudgy painters? Oh, go f*** yourself. You losers playing Pac-Man when you should be horny. Limber up those fingers.
comes packed with speed and action to challenge the player in you, and includes the first ever action game plot to entertain you. You really think this would turn me on? You think Pac-Man doesn't, cause joke's on you, it does! Finally, we're out of the PC section, and things start off with the Tiger Electronic LCD games, Jesus Christ. All roughly 20 bucks, except for this Dear Diary one, obviously it's a bit more complex, almost like a miniature electronic planner. Speaking of which, did you know Sega made something like that? A Sega Electronic Communicator and Organizer. This entire page is dedicated to everything Sega that barely counts as Sega. The Pocket Arcade, the Pico, Pods. Who the hell are you? Then there's the four pages for the Panasonic 3DO. You can trademark the word real. Roughly $70 per 32X game. That's up! 36 great holes. Who ranked them? Rayman got this bizarre temporary box art and was referred to as the Rayman. Page is dedicated to different publishers. Oh my god, like you'd think these pages are being utilized enough. Mickey, 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 Mickey. It's so cool to see temporary box art like this for games so old. To see that they didn't have Super Punch Out or Unirases or Tin Star Art, so they had to make their own. It's really something else. Oh my god, video game prices were ridiculous. Ridiculous back then. The fact that Tetris 2 is only $10 less than Super Metroid is a crime. Over the fact that X Men and the Great Circus Mystery are both $70? But at least there's a pre order bonus for Wario's Woods for the player that just couldn't wait. But then Final Fantasy 3 was 80 bucks, which it makes sense. If you're getting money out of any game, it's probably this one. Though they messed up the name in the descriptions here. Brutal Paws of Fury is more expensive than Super Metroid, Mario Paint, and Donkey Kong Country. That's confidence. This guy has nothing but pure joy to skim through. Even though half of it is taken up by old PC software, it's kind of refreshing. You don't see that stuff covered nearly as much as old school console games, so it's neat to see everything this guy covers, plus how much it all cost at the time. Each of the big video game companies generally put out their own little brochure, like this PlayStation 1 from 2002. Live in your world, play in ours. Stuart Little 2. The guys like this mainly just focus on the holiday lineup for said system, rather than what's the thing to buy. And though specific games like Sly Cooper and SOCOM get much more space than others, it's obvious Sony's really trying to push stuff like Primal. I really like catalogs like this because they help put you in the shoes of a gamer back then. I only really started to consume gaming news around 2008 or so, to be able to look at 2002 from the eyes of a PlayStation 2 owner, I think it's important. Which doing so would piss off gamers from 2002 because I'm acting like I really know what it was like to be gaming in 2002, but it would piss them off otherwise if I was only talking about how Wii music was my childhood. But hey, 2003 was my childhood, so I think a Sears catalog from this time will do wonders for me. I can immediately see a huge difference in quality here. This feels much more modern already. A $10.512 games in one LCD game. Arcade style display? What the hell are you talking about? That has more in common with a calculator than an arcade machine. It's like, oh, this is just like an arcade machine. It exists. Personalized cotton towel? As in they used a label maker? Oh my god, I always wanted one of these portable TVs. That would have been amazing to use that wherever I please. Especially if you combine it with the video center TV stand. Bring that on a trip, would ya? Oh, looks like some things never change. For all the kids who browse the wish book to circle what they want for Christmas? That's a crotch. Yes, this is a very 2003. Extreme sweatshirts next to Levi's with Levi's in bold red on the jeans. Yeah, the only reason I wear pants is because people know they're Levi's. Yes, the state of the art TV for the time was this behemoth. Now, honestly, if you're one of those old farts that say things are too complicated now, have fun moving this. What the hell? Okay, so palm handhelds uh, seem to be precursors to the palm cell phones, but these are more so digital planners. But here are palm pack games sold separately, including Rayman and a Sega Classics compilation. I have never heard of this. It turns out the Sega one is a bunch of Game Gear games. I assume this is gonna be Genesis games, but no, it's Game Gear. A microwave with a toaster built in. Who the hell wants a toaster on its side like that? You're gonna get crumbs everywhere. Gotta be honest, these pictures of toys aren't nearly as impressive as the books from the 90s. I mean, those compositions were intense. Yeah, they're pretty much just putting them on solid color backdrops. It's a huge downgrade in my opinion. But 2003, the mini LCD games have pretty much been relegated to board and card games. I had the Yahtzee one as a kid and Okay, well, I guess by 2003, Sears gave up on video games. Weird considering they still did the Palm stuff, they were selling DVD and CD players and lingerie, but no, no movies, music, or video games. For that, I suppose we have to look at the GameStop 2003 holiday catalog. This one is far more 
kind of f***ing boring. It's still cool, but every page feels the exact same. And I don't understand why most games and products have prices, but then others just have great gift or yes. Like, f***, give me answers. Much like previous years, I really find it compelling to see temporary box art. I mean, this Wario World one, I wish it wasn't temporary. I can go through these kind of things all day, and I'd love to do more in the future. But for the time being, I think this was a lovely trip down holiday memory lane. Because who doesn't look at a $2,500 tanning bed and go, nostalgia? The holidays are a stressful time, but it's important to cherish those smaller, simpler moments because in reality, those are the moments you will remember for years to come. Sometimes I remember these books more than the actual Christmases these books were for. And even then, I don't even remember a lot of the products in these books. More so, I remember spending time with my grandma circling products. I mean, those are superfluous memories, but special ones. So, thank you, Sears. Is this what his therapy sessions are like? Yeah, with less crying. Okay, well, I think we should head back to the party. But we don't want anybody to know what we're doing back here. We gotta come up with a good excuse. Well, what happened to you? Oh, he beat the shit out of me. I second that. Oh, I could use some to drink. Hey, Rex, can you give me a water? Oh, sure thing. Oh. All I have is wine. You didn't turn water into wine. So. Use those fingers for anything? To count how many jobs I lost today. No, no, no. Like, have they bought any gifts lately? I buy gifts with my heart, not my fingers. You can't tell me those hands were buying gifts earlier. I mean, look at them. I've been unemployed all day. Cut me some slack. So, you're Jesus Christ. Would Jesus lie to you? Oh my God. Hey, I got a robe in my car. The plot thickens. So you walked on ice, you chose to pick up wine, and anybody can have a robe in their car. Not if they don't have one. Hey, yeah, good point. I'll put in a good word for you with Dad. Actually, can you do me a different kind of favor? Jerry, I'm Jesus Christ, not a charity. Come on, just tell me who you got for Secret Santa. Ooh, I would, but the 11th commandment just went into effect. Okay, let's do presents! Well, I got a certain target employee for Secret Santa. I got an unemployee for Secret Santa. Oh, that's me! I got you something at Target for Christmas. Oh boy, what? Something from Target. I thought you could use the support. Oh. And I got our Lord and Savior, Rex Mose. Viagra? All of it. The entire county's wiped out. The supply chain's botched for the next quarter. Y you stopped sex for me? As long as I can get an autograph. And Terry, I got you. Which reiterates the question, why can't we just get along? There's nothing in here. What could be more vegan than nothing? I got you, Jeb. Embrace the geometry. Garbage? Fresh garbage from the dump you just opened up. This will look sick as pollution. Well, you haven't given out your prison yet. Well, that's because my secret Santa isn't here yet. What? Yeah, well, he should be here right now. What the f That's Officer Steel Wool. He murdered nearly everybody here. He fought us in court. He survived a death sentence. Why is he here? I didn't know who he was. I thought he was an abrasive sponge. Well, why would you add somebody to our secret Santa? I thought we needed one more to even it out. Oh, come on! He deserves to be here! Who's lonelier on Christmas than a dead serial killer? I forgive you. What's his deal? Oh, he thinks he's Jesus Christ. Tis the season. But now I get nothing! This wasn't what I signed up for! Yeah, it was. You signed up for therapy. Well, maybe I should talk to him. We're both in horrible moods right now. Well, in the meantime, I gotta set the record straight. Steel wool. Are you a man of God? As much as I'm a convicted serial killer. Good. Because that means you're a man of me now. Are we finally getting the inside scoop? It's the only way to convert the non-believers. I present to you, the Rex Most Crucifixion Special! Our story starts, well, my story starts, in the tallest tower of Jerusalem. I was locked up for losing a race to a tortoise, but that's irrelevant. Some called me a liar. I called myself Jesus Christ. But you can call me Rex. It's short for Rex Mose. My mother, bless her heart, was a virgin. 
and a bear. That's right, a virgin bear. The first of its kind. Bet you've never seen one of those before, huh? Might be asking how a virgin bear gave birth to me. I wonder that too. A camel was there. Three little pigs came forth bearing three separate gifts. Magic beans, magic beans, and magic beans. I was overjoyed. I planted them almost immediately, and a giant beanstalk shot up. I was overjoyed. I knew then and there, I was the son of Christ. Him? Said the local schoolyard bully. This motherfucker couldn't be born in a manger even if he tried. But I shouldn't say that, because my mother was never fucked. Me and this bully never got along, but I sure tried. I told him I was Jesus. Me and my seven best friends were so close, even if we couldn't see eye to eye most of the time. The schoolyard bully had a friend group named The Disciples, so I named mine The Disciples. I was fairly popular in high school. Everybody wanted a piece of Jesus. I couldn't blame him. I did this sick trick where I walked over water because somebody dared me to, and then afterwards I kissed a frog. That frog turned into our beloved mascot, a wolf. A wolf in my grandmother's clothing. I couldn't stop crying about it. Nobody heard me, so I cut down the stupid f***ing tree. I later got to get wooden teeth. Karma's a bitch. I was overjoyed. Any of you go through puberty as Jesus Christ? It f***ing stunk. Try telling somebody you're the son of God while you're horny. It just do it, it doesn't work. So I ventured into this garden. Red ass apples. Red as ass everywhere. I was really hungry from going through Jesus puberty, but get this, the snake told me you can't have any. And I went, well, why not? And before he had a chance to respond, I took a bite. Bad move. The apple was way too hot. The snake said they were too cold. Then this chuckle f Adam and Eve, one person, came out, unmasked themselves, and turned out they were a frog. A frog who I promptly kissed, as I thought the air was still active. The frog went ribbit and then flew away. From that point forward, I disavowed sex. I had too many Jesus to do. Me and my seven disciples were walking to school. That was so us. My buddy Judas, who I nicknamed Bluffy, decided to betray me as a joke. I thought it was really funny after I parted Lake Erie. I knew myself, I had to be stopped. It was only a matter of time until Lake Michigan wanted a piece of this. That schoolyard bully got the skinny from Judas that his name was Ponce de Leon. He said, you know what? I'm gonna nail your hands to planks of wood and watch you die. I said, can I have supper first? So, little inside fact about me. I love supper. I counted all of the suppers I've had. After adding them all up, Turns out, this was the last. I found this pee under my bed. We had that to eat. Grumpy didn't want any of his. Stinky was full. Smelly was sniffing Stinky's neck. It was a goddamn mess. And Judas, I was like, for what he did to me, I made him drink my blood. He said it was pretty good, like booze. We started hepatitis. I was like, all right, I'm ready. Let's bring it on. Then these people started beating the shit out of me, all right? They're kicking my ass. They even stole my shoe. Then they said, walk up this mountain with the cross. And I went, no, I'm not doing that shit. That's weird. They stapled my fucking hands to the thing and I was just hanging there. By the fourth hour, I was starting to get a little pissed. Some guy came up to me and thanked me for dying for his sins and I had no fucking clue what he was talking about. I was just like, who said I was dying? I, I didn't sign up for this. I thought I was just getting hazed. So guess what? I died. Not my finest moment. Moral of the story, don't get crucified. It stings. That really all happened? Well, I took some liberties to keep the story flowing. Uh, there were actually four bears. Wow, nice. Can you teach me how to cry like that? It's not fair. I just wanted this to be the best Christmas ever. Now, I don't even get a gift. A serial killer shows up to my party. I just want to feel like people want to be here because they actually want to be around me, not just because of the promise of gifts or something. I always feel like I'm an annoyance to you guys. Like, the only reason why you show up is just because you get looped into my garbage, not because you actually want to be around me. I mean, why else do I only see you guys like five times a year? I feel like I'm a complete annoyance to the people I consider my friends. Like, I to pay my therapist to show up for God's sake. You didn't. I've actually been off the clock all day. What? I care about spending the holidays with everybody here, including you. Scott, if everybody here was only showing up for gift, they wouldn't have come. We're all adults here. If we didn't want to come, we wouldn't come. We can go off and do all kinds of things around, like lose our jobs. Really? The holidays are about being around people you care about. You don't do it for something in return. I may have lost my job today, but if that's because they were wanting me to work today, no, I met Jesus Christ. It looks like we did make a new Jesus. Wow. Everybody does care. They do want to spend time with me. They do want to be here. And we did make this an amazing Christmas. Uh, who even cares if I didn't get a gift? Tough sh**, Sky. And either way, I can always just look back at all the gifts I've gotten throughout the years, which I've already done recently. Hey y'all, Scott here. I have an exciting announcement to make. I am officially old enough to not be happy. 
Let's talk about nostalgia! I own hundreds of games at this point. It's a bit of a quirk. I mean, I didn't just slip and oops, look what happened. No, I chose this lifestyle. Much like how I chose to not shower this week. And once you own this many games, your personal connection towards them starts to wane. Back when I had like 10 games, I had something unique to say about each and every one. Now, I mean, I can try. I pull a random game off the shelf. It starts with an X. That's when you have to dig deep for nostalgia. Think about your childhood games, and what games do you remember more than the ones you unwrapped on Christmas morning? This right here, this was all I wanted Christmas of 2008. Sonic Unleashed. I saw one trailer online, and my jaw dropped. It looked incredible. The beautiful graphic sense of speed. It's almost as if the game was good. Well, the trailer I watched was for the Xbox 360 version. Thankfully, a Wii release happened, as that was my only current console at the time. Once I opened it that Christmas, I immediately popped it into play. And you know what? To an 11-year-old, this looked close enough to the trailers that I wasn't too disappointed. But then the gimmick of this game showed its ugly face. The Werehog sections. You know, these aren't bad. It's not like the game is horrible. Sonic Unleashed suffers from the good stages being so good and the Werehog stages being so were. Hog. Sega shoehorned this concept of Sonic turning into a bad bitch at night to appeal to more people, but like this was never what got me interested in the game. How can you have half the game look like this and think that's not good enough? It's all because they couldn't make an entire game's worth of HD beautiful stages that you just zoom right through. It would be too expensive. So have beat em up sections where you have a snaggle tooth. The first few stages of Sonic Unleashed I adored, but yeah, after a few of the Werehog Nighttime ones, I lost interest in the game. It's a shame because this was my most hyped game ever. I was so damn excited to play this on Christmas morning. And while I liked it, I do vividly remember a Werehog stage being the last one I played before shelving it. But you know what I got right alongside Sonic Unleashed? Lego Batman the Video Game, also for Wii. Everybody has a Lego Batman story, mine just so happens to be adultery. Sonic Unleashed, we were just on a break! Two Wii games for Christmas ain't a bad deal, but the very next year in 2009, I had one of my most memorable presents ever. Ever. See, there's generally the stigma that you get your big boy presents when unwrapping them from your parents. And when you go to see your extended family, that's when you have to go in with expectations that the gifts aren't gonna be anything that expensive or massive. You know, a full-fledged Wii game, 50 bucks, that's a lot to expect from your uncle. So I just straight up didn't ask for anything like that, but lo and behold, my cousin's boyfriend bought me new Super Mario Brothers Wii. Holy sh! That was the video game for that holiday season. A full-priced one at that, and I got it for Christmas, not even from a blood relative. I must have been some 12-year-old. And with my fake ID, I still am. Sadly, being an only child made the main gimmick of New Super Mario Bros. Wii, that being multiplayer, a little inaccessible for me. But playing it as a typical Mario game, I still had a good time with it, no doubt about that. But I think the rush of getting it as an extended family Christmas gift still resides inside me. Looking back at old family photos, enhance! That's f***ing Simpsons Road Rage. 2005, this was one of my gifts, a Game Boy Advance copy of Road Rage. This is literally a crazy taxi clone, but it's quality, especially for a GBA game. I found it so incredibly impressive, just driving around in a 3D space on a Game Boy Advance, it was so cool. I never really even played the taxi missions, I just kept selecting the Sunday drive mode and explored the world. But you can't play Simpsons Road Rage without patent infringement, and a Game Boy Advance. 2003 was the year I got a Game Boy Advance SP. Now, to be fair, I had a normal Game Boy Advance prior. I got that for my birthday the year prior alongside a copy of SpongeBob SquarePants Legend of the Lost Spatula because, you know, I'm me. But the very next year, I got the SP model, that gorgeously vibrant red model nestled in a new carrying case. This was my magnum opus, owning a Game Boy Advance SP. No longer needing batteries, the clamshell design made it more compact, the backlit screen made the screen possible to see for the first time ever? See, that is a child that has finally seen the light. Fast forwarding to 2011, that was the year I finally upgraded to an Xbox 360 with the Kinect bundle. And there was this GameStop deal going on during Black Friday that I convinced my mom to scarf down on. As you can tell, this was at the point where I no longer had much whimsy with Christmas presents. It was more so pointing and saying that. Hey, that still made for a great Christmas. Lots of games came as a part of this whole shtick. I got Kinect Adventures with the 360, plus Adventures invested in Dance Central, U Star 2, and GoldenEye 007 Reloaded. And then on top of that, my mom bought me the Gun Stringer without my knowledge. How nice of her. This was a pretty fun holiday, just a lot of stuff I wanted. Especially U Star 2, you get to put yourself in movie clips. I a 
adored this concept. Uh, the problem was nobody in my family cared to play along with it. Like I tried to set it up at some gatherings and nobody wanted to play ball, which was so lame. You ever have that? Where you have a dumb little product, you want to give a go at family gatherings and nobody wants to look like a jackass for your amusement. Yeah, it pisses me off too. You Betty. Oh shoot, I got a weed tower and a chair in 2009. I completely forgot about that. How could I forget being a gamer? Pretty much the games like these, I will always have that personal connection to. And out of all the products to have a personal connection to, I'm happy it's these video games. Video games can take the form of many gifts during the holidays, whether they're the games themselves, they're in holiday gift guides, or they're gift cards. And they're always some of the best presents you could possibly get. But it's everything around those gifts that's truly special. Who gave it to you? Who played it with you on that holiday morning? The joy of opening up that present from somebody you care about or seeing the face of somebody you care about give you the gift. All of those matter way more than the gifts themselves. It truly goes to show that Christmas is all about the experience of being around the people you love. So just don't be a spoiled bitch. Wow, someone looks satisfied. Oh, it's Scott's back too. You guys, this is the best Christmas ever. But, but who even cares? There's no need to rank them because as long as we're together, every year is the best Christmas ever. What the All right. Merry Christmas. A little birdie told me you'd like this. Wow, how did you know? I told you, birds. Hey guys, it took some convincing, but after I showed them the true meaning of Christmas, <laughs> They gave me my job at Target back. I was just demoted to CFO. I assumed that true meaning of Christmas had to do with some non-alcoholic, anti-satiriasis, wannabe Jesus. Hey, I gave you your vegan present. And I ate it already. It's over. My, I guess we'll never truly see eye to eye on this. Or anything. Double anything! Go not have sex. Go eat a bush! Hey, you guys have really been polishing off that spiked eggnog. Spiked? Egg? Wanna geek out about puking? Very. What a Christmas. It's so great, I think even Jesus would agree. Uh, sadly, uh, he went home an hour ago. But even with this being such a great Christmas, I can't help but feel something's missing. Hey. Chet Shaft, I thought you were murdered by steel wool. Well, nothing lasts forever. How did you rise from the dead? I felt like it was because of some kind of funny cult magic. Smelled like it too. I think that was because of us during Halloween! And to think I ever doubted that you would join a cult. So, uh, what brings you here? I got a call from some therapist saying you were all in need of some extra feet for some gift exchange. Really? Who got you a present? Steel Wool. He got me no hard feelings. I went above and beyond. But, uh, I got you. Got you this. It has a letter A in it. Reminded me of your last name. You remembered. Oh boy! I can't wait to own something from somebody who actually cares! Something I'll make the most out of to show my gratification! Something new! Something I don't own 40 copies of! Something... I'll get to next year.
Hey y'all, Scott here. Go greet a season. It's the busiest Christmas Eve of the year for us over here at the Left Pole. Uh, Santa's got the North covered, we got the left. I formed this company when I noticed that Santa Claus was the only supplier of holiday cheer. If I wanted it from anybody else, I'd have to convert religions. It's a monopoly, and if you disagree, well, I don't. Competition helps everybody, especially self-esteem. Santa's been cruising on elf labor and white hair for the past 2,000 years, and it's all because nobody stood up to him to tell him to do better. So, we have four hours to finish and deliver gifts to every person on Earth. Ever? I don't think Santa does the dead one, so that's a good market to reach. We can't travel the world by ourselves. That's a nine deer job. Put me in a room with nine deer and tell us to do a job. I'll finish top five. We've only finished two presents so far, and one's an IOU. Okay, well, if it comes down to it, the pack of cigarettes, we can separate amongst 20 people. I just don't see how we compete with Santa. We don't have anything to combat him. We don't have silver bullets. We don't have garbage. Well, we're just gonna have to learn everything Christmas. We're gonna have to do everything he does. I'm going as fast as I can! Jerry, how's our biblical research going? I just got to the part about cannibals. Oh, my bad. Inbreeding. Uh, target employee, have you opened the door yet for us to walk outside? Ah, uh, yeah, my hands are pooped. Well, does anybody have any spare ups to give? I gave those up long ago. Who am I kidding? We're never gonna be able to compete with Santa. We'll never be not real like he is. Now, now. I think we're gonna have a shot. We just gotta stop making these presents by hand. There's gotta be something lying around here that can suffice as a gift. What about this? No, I need that. It helps remind me there's a dead rat on the floor I need to clean up. Okay, what about all those games in the shopping cart? Oh yeah. them. Why do you have all these games here? I was gonna return them. Why are they in a shopping cart? I was gonna return that too. You hoard games all the time. Why do you wanna get rid of these? Well, one of them has blood on it. And this one's got shit on it. Wait, no it doesn't. Yeah, it does. Well then why are you returning it then? I need answers. And I'm not getting it from here. You really wanna know? It all started. Well, I can go as far back as the birth of Satan, but I'll fast forward to 1983. The video game industry was in a tough spot after the boom of arcades and home video game consoles. Many companies said, hey, that's a great idea. Let's do that too. Two, 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 two. Oversaturation. There was no quality control. Everybody was making video games because for consoles like the Atari 2600, there was no procedure to get a game approved for release on the system. You could just release a game for the system. Because of this, retailers didn't know what games were the ones they wanted to keep in stock. Consumers were getting burned by bad quality titles and the industry entered the infamous crash of 1983, all because everybody thought they could open a video game company this year. Introducing Data Design Systems. Who are they? Bad. But at the time, they were just like any other small software developer based out of the UK. They would go on to craft gaming experiences, mostly for home computers, such as the Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC, and ZX Spectrum. The games such as Tobruk The Clash of Armor, DNA Warrior, and Annals of Rome. <laughs> But by the time 1990 rolled around, Data Design Systems was no more. Acquired by Stuart Green's company, Green Solutions, the studio was renamed to one Data Design Interactive. Does that name ring a bell? Well, or maybe these images will refresh your memory. Hmm? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that Data Design Interactive. Well, throughout the 1990s, they developed numerous titles of a lower quality. It wasn't until the mid-2000s hit with the introduction of the Nintendo Wii that they finally rose to infamy. From 2004 to 2009, they created over 30 titles, more than half of their entire resume of games released since 1983. While Data Design was pretty much always a developer of lesser titles, they pushed that perception to its limit in the Wii era. And the crazy thing is, they benefited from it. The quantity over quality initiative they were focusing on actually succeeded. They were doing well during this time because of the casual consumer base of the Wii picking up their games just because of the low price not knowing any better. They opened a US office, secured licenses for well-known brands, and boasted 40% market share of all value priced Wii games in Europe, all because they won people over with cheap prices and enticing box art. <laughs> I can't say I wouldn't. Thankfully. This business strategy did not work in the long run, as just a few years later, in 2009, 
Trading ceased at the company, and it later went fully defunct in 2012. Satan speed, Data Design. During my numerous shovelware benders, I've already experienced many of Data Design's most infamous titles. I don't wanna look at them anymore. They remind me of bad. Well, regardless of the quality, they are pretty multi-purpose. Like I could use this as a rectangle. So it's settled. We'll use these as Christmas presents. Well, you know what they say. Sure. No, they don't. They say yes. And so do I. All right. We're in a product testing zone. If we're gonna distribute these, we gotta do product testing. We can't do that, we don't have time. Do we really wanna risk the lives and safety of children everywhere? Do we not wanna meet our deadline? You know what, fine. The only way you can truly defeat a demon is by taking a look at its entire life and understanding fully why it is the way it is. And the sooner we get that out of the way, the sooner I can get out of here and achieve glory. Well, let's test out the worst game developer of all time's entire catalog of games and see if we actually gain anything from that. Oh my god, is that a lump? We already have. First off, you know how the old saying goes. One of Data Design's first major releases was Tobruk, The Clash of Armor in 1987. They did a couple of incredibly obscure independent ZX Spectrum releases beforehand alongside some actual professional software, but I'm only talking the real stuff, you know? the. Stuff that can make me cry. Released exclusively in the UK for personal computers at the time, Tobruk the Clash of Armor was a bit of a revelation for everybody. Evil is born. You're telling me this was the first thing they made? What was their MO? Was Smirnoff funding them? Tobruk is a turn-based strategy game from the 80s. You know what that means. <laughs> Not only does this age poorly, I don't think this game in particular was ever at the top of the food chain. I can't really say this is abhorrent. I mean, this is a World War II strategy game from 1987. As much as I would love to tell them do better, the wall isn't responding. Afterwards, Data Design mainly created multi-platform versions of pre-existing titles. The ZX Spectrum versions of Annals of Rome and DNA Warrior, the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC versions of Loops. These were all UK only releases, so Thank God, that body of water is really coming in handy. I mean, look at these games. What do you want me to say about them? There's not much to say. Oh, man, that's actually pretty good. There's not much to say about these. They're either incredibly bland, simple, and flat out bad budget PC games from the late 80s, early 90s, or they're not nearly as good. But that brings us to Data Design's home console efforts. Here on the second master system, they ported Xenon 2 Mega Blast. How do we know that? Oh, that's how. Jesus Christ, could this run any slower? Yes. Xenon 2 is a perfectly fine shoot 'em up at its core that just so happens to also be painfully slow when anything other than your ship appears on screen. So I wouldn't say it's bad, I'd just say it's unplayable. But hey, Data Design's catalog thus far may not be anything to write home about, but at least it's fairly inoffensive. I mean, how good you hate the developers of Game Boy Jeopardy? Oh. Well, regardless, this may be Data Design's best effort yet, which isn't saying much. It's pretty hard to mess up Jeopardy, especially when this version is heavily based on the NES game developed by Rare, so they had two sources to base this project off of. It'd be more impressive if they f***ed it up. But no, it's just Jeopardy on the go. Same types of questions you normally get during a game. A tree dweller whose name implies one of the seven deadly sins. Keebler. Alphabetically, it's number one. Hey! It lay in the house that Jack built. Jack. The more accurate name for the American Buffalo. North American Buffalo. The Herring Lake fish often requested off a pizza. Bad fish. Aesop character that won by a hair. Rapunzel. Admirals, this father of the nuclear sub managed to serve 18 years beyond compulsory retirement age. Admiral? Captain Crunch. No, not that, not that cereal mascot. Right, Chocula. And it turns out because Data Design did an adequate enough job with Jeopardy, they got Jeopardy Sports Edition and Wheel of Fortune on Game Boy as well. If you needed a Game Boy or ZX Spectrum version of your game, well, they were guy. They weren't your guy, my guy, no guy. They were just guy. But they must have impressed somebody because they received one of the highest honors a developer can receive, porting a version of James Pond 2 codenamed Robocod. I mean, look at how many versions exist. How could it not be? Now, who's James Pond? All right, well, that question's answered. My apologies if I sound a bit like a Scrooge, but I don't like that f***ing fish. Oh, come on, where's your Christmas spirit? All right, my bad. Let's see what the fish can do. Merry Christmas, Jerry. 
Listen, you gotta understand, I, I can't do both of these at the same time. Data Design is responsible for the Commodore 64 and Game Boy versions of the title, the latter being known as Super James Bond over here. God, this is just a sloppy, bare-bones platformer. It, it just reeks of a game that was on your PC when you were little, and that's why you played it, because it was there. Now, I'll be fair to Data Design, this isn't an issue exclusive to their versions of the game, this is the James Bond 2 wide epidemic. So let's see if they redeem themselves with their very own platform developed wholly by data design, this is Pinky. That isn't Pinky, that's just pink. Wow, a platformer with really bright, colorful, detailed visuals, great music, ho-hum controls, and boring level design? I'm impressed! This was followed by Exit on Amiga, a simple block-pushing puzzle game. Nothing to write home about, but it was fine enough for what it was. But that wasn't enough for data design. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. They couldn't stop it being just mediocre. They had to craft one of the worst video games of all time th that didn't involve a, a, a f***ing fish. Data design is responsible for the SNES, Game Boy, and Sega Mega Drive, that's the Sega Genesis in Europe, versions of Rise of the Robots, an infamous fighting game. One of the most notorious examples of, oh God. Visually, this ain't half bad. It's honestly pretty impressive for the time. The gameplay on the other hand, oh Jesus. This game was intensely hyped up as some kind of good game. It was mostly all about the graphics, but then it came out. And while the visuals were sufficient considering how heavily marketed they were, the gameplay is so basic and in some areas flat out broken. You have three variations of punches and kicks, but they all look the same. There's barely any characters, bland and lifeless environments, and would you believe the SNES version may be one of the better versions of the game? Another case of data design not being entirely at fault here. In fact, they might have been the most competent developer of all of the Rise of the Robots releases. Say what you will, but they put full motion cutscenes in the damn Game Gear version. Like, come on! The game may be a sloppy, incompetent fighter that's mediocre to mash buttons too at best, but it's like that everywhere, so how much of this is Data Design's fault? Looking at the reviews of the Game Gear version, all of it. Of course, after that, they had to hop back to what they were best at, Jeopardy on Game Boy with Platinum Edition. Several opera scores by this Italian rival of Mozart. Wozart? It's located between EST and MST. The letter S! This is endless, restless, and useless, and it killed the cat. A gun. Appending these four letters to an odor means to execute it at once. Once. This round flat bread is the flat basis of tacos, enchiladas, and burritos. Bread after I sit on it. I misspelled after. A note that's neither sharp nor flat is said to be this. Silent, but deadly. Jessica Tandy won a Tony for this role in a streetcar named Desire. Donald the Duck. Nanette is a composition for this many musical instruments or voices. No, I don't speak Italian. I told you! Platinum Edition is the exact same game as the original, just now with new questions, just like Jeopardy Teen Tournament on Game Boy, released the same year as Platinum Edition. This was their bread and butter, coming up with trivia. I mean, the categories in this round of Jeopardy are immaculate. What should I choose? State capitals for 100 or state capitals for 100? But by 1997, it was about time for the company to head back to their strategy game roots with the title Conquest Earth First Encounter for PC published by Eidos. Damn, this may be their first big original release not based on any prior work that launched outside of the UK. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Damn it, go back, go back. No, it sounds the same. Conquest Earth seems to be Data Design's biggest effort yet with all these animated and live action cutscenes. But much like Rise of the Robots, it feels like they did everything but make a damn game. This is a real time strategy game. Without the strategy, and in fact, the thing that requires the most strategy is navigating the interface. But when we get into the game itself, it's just mindless. You just move your units one toe at a time and kill each enemy. That's it. It's like making a platformer where most of the levels are just straight shots with enemies. It makes sense then when there's a hole in level 45, you go, holy shit. Conquest Earth was a huge disappointment for many. I mean, Eidos was a well-known publisher. This game got actual press. It wasn't like many of Data Design's other titles, which pretty much just flew under the radar. This was their big chance to make a name for themselves. The eyes were on this game at the time, and they blew it. But, as we can see, that doesn't really matter in the video game industry. Data Design achieved the license to one of the most beloved properties of all time. Not the Raiders! Lego Rock Raiders on PC, another 
goddamn strategy game. What the hell was their problem? Man, you're not good at making sandwiches. But all I own is bread! However, despite how their previous strategy games came out, LEGO Rock Raiders is generally well-liked and still has a fairly active fan community. It's not the mind-blowing, but it's one of those games you can tell that if you played it as a kid, you'd probably look back at it fondly today. Of course, that means if you have no nostalgia link to it and try playing it right now, you're not necessarily gonna be won over. But you can at least clearly see a decent enough PC game for kids here. So yeah, this one ain't half bad. So ain't half bad, it received a PlayStation release, also developed by Data Design. Well, if the PC version wasn't half bad, this is well over 60%. What the hell happened here? This is a completely different game, and while Rock Raiders on PC was okay, this this is genuinely abysmal. This is a top-down game where you just walk around and collect all the green crystals in these unbelievably dark levels with nothing of note in them. It's just walk around and find all the things. This, this is horrible. I know what you mean. My father's dead. I guess we're good out. Data Design could take your beloved kid's toy license and give you something to bitch about at Thanksgiving. Because shortly after LEGO, Data Design took a stab at Tonka with Tonka Space Station on PC and PlayStation can arrest them. Why have so many companies entrusted these guys with their brands? Kids brands, no less. Have you seen what they do in their spare time? Dude, this game is notorious for making no damn sense, at least to every person in the world ever. There's no explanations, no tutorials. It's up to you to figure out how Tonka made it to space. Fortunately, the amount of time you have to spend figuring the controls and objectives out makes up for the lack of content in the game. Stretches a 30 minute game to about five or six hours. That's good. Well, this game is bad, and there's still a certain level of quality it adheres to. It's something that doesn't look out of the ordinary for a children's PC game from the early 2000s, which unfortunately leads this game to be pretty pretty easily forgotten, which is really bad when you're trying to find something to play. <laughs> this looks fun. So if these are bad, unmemorable games, something has to change. Oh, I was just gonna try a different shirt. This was the era of data design shift in focus from bad video games to the Antichrist. Yeah, around the same time as Tonka Space Station, there was two other data design releases, Tonka Monster Trucks and Gubble Buggy Racer on PC. Yeah, well, this spits in the face of my belief system. They can't drive. Tonka Space Station got a PS1 release, Conquest Earth, and especially LEGO Rock Raiders on PC are well known and popular enough to figure out how to run them on modern hardware. Gubble Buggy Racer, I'm not even positive exists. Like this shouldn't be that hard to figure out. It's Gubble Buggy Racer, not God. Doesn't mean you can't find downloads for it online, and I got pretty damn close to running this thing. I deserve a medal. <laughs> I guess all I can do is gawk at gameplay online. Uh, Scott's opinion is, do three dots count? Tonka Monster Trucks is far easier to find a physical copy of, but that doesn't mean anything when it comes to running it on a modern PC. A similar issue to Gubble Buggy Racer, but like what I said about Tonka Space Station, while these games may all be of a lower quality, you can still see a bit of effort here. It's like, my god, you included the color yellow? But once Data Design entered the sixth generation of gaming, Everything changed with the release of Nickelodeon Party Blast. Oh my god, Data Design's making bad games now? It's a crossover between all your favorite Nickelodeon characters like Cat from Cat Dog and Dog from Cat Dog. There's five mini games to play here. Five, one, two, three, four, five. It is very useful. I only have to use one hand to describe this game. Cause the other one is busy. Okay, so I think a one out of 10 is a bit harsh for this game. A two, maybe? I think as a Nickelodeon product, there's enough here for a child to think they like it. Some voice acting, enough references to the source material. It's not incredible in these regards, but it does enough to ensure children will just convince themselves this is good. Look, it's Jimmy Neutron. I knew it was missing something. But outside of the license, this game has about 20 minutes of content overall, with such a small amount of mini games that all play and control abysmally. It's not unplayable. But why does that matter? Why would you want to play it? Nickelodeon Party Blast feels designed around the concept of kids? Stupid. They don't know any better. They'll play anything with a smile in it. And they'll do it over and over and over again. The children will replay the same movie 4,000 times, so why put more than five minigames in the title? They won't notice. Their brains don't fully grow until they're 25. And I just realized this game kind of sucks. This design philosophy is what carried data design through the next 10 years. 
It's a pretty rock solid plan. I mean, I don't want shit, so don't give it to me. And thus, data design stopped giving a shit. Five games in 2004, all original IPs on the PlayStation 2. And the first one is Myth Makers Orbs of Doom. Are you sure it's not lie pumpers? Circles are bad? Yeah, orbs just don't really do it for me. No <laughs> spheres, though. Why do I have to respond to that? Yeah, just so lie pumper circles are bad, you may be looking at like, oh, this is D tier monkey ball. I'd say it's more like A tier Denny's. This is a part of Data Design's new series, Myth Makers. Every Walt Disney needs their Mickey Mouse. Every Vlad the Impaler needs something fed up. So I guess the basis here is that the Myth Makers are child looking creatures. Uh, children, if you will. Dressed up as fictional, mythical icons. You have Trixie as the Easter Bunny, uh, Nick as Santa Claus. Why stop there? Where is he? I guess this guy is our main villain, but that's just profiling. I don't think he appears in the actual game because this thing has no cutscenes, no story, no nothing. It's all about reading between the lines with this one. Oh, it's just a very simple, bland, and lifeless Super Monkey Ball clone with some of the most uninteresting level designs you could ask for. Why would you ask for that? The game's beatable in under an hour, and even when you do, nothing happens. They just kick you back to the title screen. I mean, I would at least want an apology. However, disregarding how bad of a game this is, well, when you do that, it's not that bad. It functions, and thankfully, to rectify that, Data Design released a Wii version three years later. All right, so it's Orbs of Doom with a tweaked menu screen and forced motion control. Uh, how do I describe these? Like, you ever tried tilting a hot dog down? That shit hurts. Yeah, I would have vastly preferred if they had you hold the Wii Remote sideways to tilt around instead of vertically. But, you know what they say, f this game. But see, this was all a part of Data Design's big strategy. First off, release numerous games on the PlayStation 2 and PC in Europe only. For some reason, Europe had pretty lenient guidelines on what legally qualified as a PlayStation 2 game over there. The Mouse Police. No, they don't make cuffs that small! Some incredibly low quality releases on the platform occurred only in Europe, many of which were published by a company known as Phoenix Games, who happened to work with Data Design to publish many of their titles too. Then when the Nintendo Wii came out, they saw this as an opportunity not only to bring their games to a new console, but a new market as well. This was how us Ohioans played most of Data Design's games from this era, the Wii version of the European PlayStation 2 version of bad. But some games remained exclusive to Europe and the PlayStation 2 and PC, such as one Habit Trail Hamster Ball. I know you may be asking, what's Habit Trail, Scott? Well, I can answer the first question. Habit Trail is a line of hamster accessories. Yeah, Data Design secured the rights to a hamster ball brand. I didn't know there were rights to secure. The game even has special menus showing tips on proper hamster care, the do's and don'ts of owning a hamster, what to feed them, hamster food good, poison bad. This game's just trying to sell me on damn hamster bleach. Well, Habit Trail Hamster Ball is... Let's move on to another game. All right, next up. Hamster Heroes. Oh, great. Now I have to thank them for their service? I already do. So what do these little critters do that I can't do with a 12 gauge? Nothing. As long as you have that gun, these hamsters are worthless. Hamster Heroes is... Let's move on to another game. Three damn rodent in a ball games? Hell, four if you want to count how Hamster Heroes was reprinted with a different cover. These look like damn mice. Let the war rage on. Now, all these games are pretty damn similar, but they do have differences, you know? Orbs, balls, mice. Hamster Heroes definitely feels better to control than Orbs of Doom, but the level design is way more nonsensical. And then you have Habit Trail, which is just a complete joke with its level design. So yeah, there's a game for everybody. But while each of these games are different, they're really not at the same time. They have the same assets, user interface, features. I mean, it feels like they just drag and drop new art into the loading screens and called it a day. I mean, Hamster Heroes and Habit Trail Hamster Ball are pretty much the exact same thing outside of Habit Trail taking place in a bedroom, Heroes in a lab, and the hamsters have got to be bleeding. Well, I'd trade a bleeding hamster for a bloody rat any day. Let's try Myth Maker Supercart GP, another 2004 European PS2 release that came over here on the Wii in 2007. Finally, the Myth Makers can bitch about gas prices with my dad. It's an extraordinarily basic Mario Kart clone, the one that includes environments from Orbs of Doom, which is world building. It's like seeing something up on the news. It adds a layer. So this is a game 
that works. It's so basic, it would be surprising if it didn't. The controls are a little touchy, but they do the job, though. Why do I have to shake the controller to use an item? I already have to tilt it to steer. That's like rubbing your stomach while patting your head while driving. You do as little as even think about touching anything in the game, and your cart's gonna flip out. You're gonna end up backwards or on your side. The physics are completely messed up, and thankfully, the game knows that and resets you back in place if it detects that you spun out. But that just leads me to ask, what, you didn't consider these as cries for help? There's barely any content here, too. They basically have four tracks that are just repeated throughout the rest of the game, except now it's nighttime, or now you have to do the track backwards. Yeah, yeah, that, that's more content. Uh, much like how Sonic Colors in Europe has more content than the North American release. See? Well, maybe Data Design's other kart racing effort is effort. This is Action Girls Racing. Wait a second. This is just Living World Racing again! Yeah, Living World Racing was a European-only PS2 and PC release. And, similar to Habitrail Hamster Ball, it has the endorsement of Rodent Studios. Yeah, I thought Living World was a children's cartoon series or something, like the busy world of Richard Scarry. Dude, they make rat food. But we can pick from some of our favorite living world animals. Mr. Mouse, Mr. Hamster, Mr. Rat, Mr. Guinea Pig, Mr. Chinchilla, Mr. Dwarf Rabbit, Mr. Rabbit, and Mr. Ferret. Now, what can we infer by this character roster? The absolute sausage fest. But also how living world has a vast array of iconic characters. I mean, they are all here on the loading screen. That's Mr. Mouse. So surely, because this is a racing game featuring these characters and they're prominently featured with names, I can look up Mr. Mouse from living world and see all the other wacky adventures Mr. Mouse has gotten himself into. Well, I got news for ya. There is no Mr. Mouse, Mr. Hamster, Mr. Rat, Chinchilla, Guinea Pig, Dwarf, Rabbit, Rabbit, Ferret. The, the only example of these characters being as they are is Living World Racing, a racing game starring your favorite characters from Living World Racing. I thought for as long as I had this game, oh, this must be some kid show in Europe. Not only, no, they make rat betting, but these characters aren't even characters, which for a character named Mr. Rat? I'm f***ing shocked! So the only person this game would appeal to... Oh, to be a mouse for a day. ...is that. This one isn't good either. I mean, thankfully, with this being only on PS2 and PC, there's no forced motion controls, though it's not like those are unbearable on Wii. They're just really f***ing bad. But it's not like any of these are necessarily better or worse. They're just the same damn games. Even the power-ups are basically copy and pasted. If I had to pick one, I'd say Action Girls Racing may be the worst. I mean, the first level, the first damn level, is one of the worst designed pieces of fiction I've ever experienced. The first damn thing you do in the course is go through doors that just look like they're part of the background. Then you're expected to make turns like this? This feels like a damn platformer level you shoved go-karts in. Like, judging from Data Design's new strategy, let's check out their platformers to see if this stage originated somewhere. Actually, it, I just found where it came from. This is Ninja Breadman. It's a cookie. Wait, I've, I've seen that before. Uh, that's Milk's best friend. You know, maybe we shouldn't be paid in cookies and milk when we deliver these presents. The bank doesn't take them, I've tried. Yeah, well, the, the tooth fairy gets paid in teeth. We can get paid in like, I don't know, fingernails? Could be the finger fairies? We can't do that, we need a drink too. How about tomato soup? No, we'll stay in the snow. Why don't we get $200 a piece? So this is our current project proposal. Now it is! So is Ninja Bread Man just a gingerbread cookie ninja, or is this just a whole ass subgenre? Well, let's see how Data Design does platformers. They don't. What the f? Okay, I'm I'm dead. And I'm I'm dead again! Oh my god, why bees? What, they couldn't get the rights to flies? This game feels like chafing. We just collect all the keys to unlock the portal at the end and move on to the next stage. Repeat that six times and you're not playing Ninja Bread Man because there's only four levels. Wow, this game is so bad. It only has four levels. Did you want more? While the Wii game only tells you to jump with the nunchuck, you can jump with the Z button, which is the most concrete evidence I've seen so far that God exists. For some reason, Data Design forced motion control into all of their Wii ports, which I never understood that's more work because without motion control this game plays perfectly fine on the playstation 2 to find plays candyland is under attack you're just asking to be sued pick a more original name will you oh no scrabble is under attack hordes of snapping cupcakes see i just don't get that shit. Why are they attacking me? I'm one of them! Throw ninja stars to stun enemies and follow up with the mighty samurai sword, reducing enemies into a quivering pool of raspberry jam. Even the bees? It's just a completely generic 3D platformer, one that gives me... 
just by controlling it because Ninja Bread Man is so damn fast and using your weapon is so damn slow that every moment in this game just feels like <laughs> it works. It's a game, but it's the bare minimum of what I'd call one. You can beat it in under an hour. Hell, probably 20 minutes if you knew what you were doing. Done! Yeah. <laughs> He's a f***ing cookie, I know. So, Ninja Bread Man, not the best it could be. Similar sentiment I have towards organized crime. I'd definitely rather play it than Data Design's kart racing efforts. Most of those are just incredibly boring. Ninja Bread Man's got that and bees. Next in line of Data Design's We Era platformers is this. Anubis 2? They made a second new bis? Oh, I love the first one. It had graphics, graphics, graphics. Graphics. graphics? The only graph I'm saying ick to is this one. Graphics. There's no Anubis 1? There's no Anubis 1 graphics. on any screen I'm aware of. And graphics. that includes a screen on my back door. And I ain't talking about my ass. Why are you whispering that to me? Anubis 2 is actually supposed to be pronounced Anubis the Second, as if this is the offspring of the original Egyptian god Anubis. Okay, that's fine, but just call the game Anubis Jr. There will never be another incarnation of the Egyptian god Anubis. Wait! And drum roll, please. Damn, all we could get was a rim shot. Of course it's the same goddamn thing as Ninja Bread Man. I mean, even if there isn't an actual Anubis 1, there is. Anubis 2 actually does switch things up though, featuring more levels, longer levels. Cause that was Ninja Bread Man's problem. There wasn't enough of it. While there are enough changes between most of Data Design's work here to classify these as different games, I mean, I may be playing data design games right now, but I ain't stupid. I've just run out of options to gain a personality. These are the same damn things, evident by one rock and roll adventures. Yup. I always thought Ninja Bread Man was oddly Elvis shaped. Then we have the third in the Myth Maker series, Myth Maker's Trixie and Toyland. Before we see what it is, uh, let's go over what it might be. Wrong, bad. It's strange how the platformer was the third Myth Makers game while the monkey ball clone and cart racer came before it. But hey, you know, leave it to data design to break conventions. For example, most people say you shouldn't eat piss. Hey, you drink it. Myth Makers is just like Ninja Bread Man, which is just like Anubis 2, which is just like Rock and Roll Adventures. It's like Elvis with ears. And that's Data Design's lineup of 3D platformers for the PS2, PC, and Wii, which pales in comparison to all the damn racing games. Listen, there's nothing to say about these games. Monster Trucks Arenas. Have any of you ever played this game? God, no. This game involves my three biggest fears. Monsters, trucks, in the Monster Trucks Arena video game. My three biggest fears are men, bread, and losing my brother in a homicide. I know how you feel. I got a gluten allergy. The Monster Trucks games are just the same as the car racers, but with big ass cars. Rig Racer 2 is the same as the Monster Trucks games, but with trucks. Now where's Rig Racer 1? I don't know. Maybe it's the same as Anubis the second, and it's pronounced Rig Racer the second. Goodyear Racing, Classic British Motor Racing, Urban Extreme Street Rage, and all the damn Kawasaki games. The snowmobiles, quad bikes, jet ski. Yeah, Data Design got the license to make a jet ski game with the Kawasaki brand. The same license Nintendo got for their jet ski game, Wave Race 64. So in a weird way, Data Design created a spiritual successor to Wave Race 64. It's obvious why Data Design pumped out so many racing games. I mean, they're obviously fairly easy to iterate on. You can make a Monster Trucks game and a Truck Trucks game, swap the cars and environments, and for some reason, these two feel more distinct than Ninja Bread Man and Anubis 2. But outside of these examples, they did some more experimental racing games, like London Taxi, Russ Hour. This is a clone of the Crazy Taxi series, which is a bit less egregious than Billy the Wizard Rocket Broomstick Racing, which is a clone of, uh, uh, got little wizards. Oh. My. God. Moving on. Earache Extreme Metal Racing, based on the record label Earache. That's just great. Yeah, next up, Crash Easter Egg Hunt. Mini Desktop Racing. These are all horrible, okay? B Billy and Desktop have the worst feeling controls of the bunch. Lud and Taxi is probably the most tolerable. And then Earache, it's just badass. Much like misspelling kids while playing sports. It's the kids sports series. Here's basketball. And ice hockey. And international football. You know, in Europe on the PS2, this was called City Soccer Challenge. Soccer, 
In Europe! You're in Europe. Why are you calling it the American term? You don't call crumpets cheese nips over there. The kids' sports series is about as bland as it gets. But I will admit, for what they are, they do the job. Unlike the kids' sports series. This almost looks like it's from an entirely different franchise. Kids' sports? Crazy mini golf, featuring new U technology, allowing anybody to put themselves in the game. Th th wait, wait, what? Wait, wait, Rex, what are you doing? Oh, I just decided to tinker. Tinker? Yeah, it's tank brought to the next level. A chicken man. It. It doesn't work. This game doesn't work. I have no idea how anybody can control this. Like, what the hell am I doing wrong? I'm not playing Crazy Mini Golf 2, obviously. And I'm still wrong. Now, Data Design put out Junior League Sports later on, which is pretty much an updated compilation of kids sports basketball, ice hockey, and soccer all on one disc. Be even nicer if they included more of their games here, like uh, Party Pigs Farmyard Games. It's just a bunch of hogs competing in the Olympics, but, but it's on a farm. Oh, oh, that's what the title meant. I have to admit, though, this was a later data design release. No PS2 or PC version. This launched fully for the Wii in 2009, and I mean, it's not good, but it's its own game. It's not reusing loads of assets like previous Wii efforts. This is an original data design release. We haven't gotten one of those in years. Why stop there? How about Battle Rage the Robot Wars? This has no obvious data design attributes outside of the fact it's poorly designed and controlled and the game as a whole rips ass, but still. My personal golf trainer on Wii is a completely different beast from the Crazy Mini Golf series and intends on teaching you how to properly play golf rather than whatever the hell that series was doing to my brain. This is pretty much just a series of videos with some interactive segments here and there. Best damn thing they've done. Well, this means things are looking up. What I said still applies. Okay, what's left? Uh, well, some licensed kids games exclusive to Europe on the PlayStation 2, An American Tale, Casper and the Ghostly Trio, and Casper's Scare School. What do these all have in common? Yeah, they all fucking stink. An American Tale is a very sloppy, basic, and simple minigame collection disguised as a level-based story mode, and is pretty much a data design sampler platter. First couple stages are monkey ball clones, followed by some platformer stages, and it'll take you roughly 35 minutes to get through this. 30 if we shave off the time I spent on the title screen. Casper and the Ghostly Trio and Casper's Scare School are both cut from the same cloth, both incredibly basic and generic platformers. Uh, better than Ninja Breadman, uh, worse than Forced Extinction of Species. There, all data design games tested. If we're quick, we can catch up to Santa. It's only 2 a.m. on April 16th. Oh man, I had work a month ago. I can't believe we missed the deadline for Christmas Eve! We wasted four months playing these games! Well, I wouldn't say wasted. Probably just say misused. Yeah! I enjoyed not talking about my ass for four months. Yeah, I enjoyed not hearing about it. Yeah, it says right here. I'm pretty cool. And by proxy, so are all you. I mean, yeah, actually. Looking back at it all, it doesn't really feel like a waste of my time because I spent it with all of you. That's it! We do have the competitive edge! Santa may be able to give all these physical gifts, but we don't need that! We have our time and company and friendship! We have the experience of going through all these horrible games together that'll last us through our entire lives! That's way more valuable than something you can unwrap. These games as gifts are absolute garbage, but the memories we made spending time with each other going through them, that's priceless. And that can be what sets us apart. We won't give away presents, we'll give away our time and energy. Come on guys, it's a beautiful snowy April night in Ohio. Let's go caroling! Ah! Well, that's how I spend my 114 days at Christmas and... I don't regret it. Data Design Interactive is the worst game developer of all time. There's no getting around that. But that doesn't mean they never tried. Going through their history, it's honestly really sad to see a studio just trying to get by doing what they could. Uh, picking up porting jobs, making all different types of games, just trying to see what sticks. And in the end, what ended up working for them was oversaturating the market with constant, 
garbage budget releases that were all clones of each other. It felt like they were saying, we give up, we know we're bad, let's not even try anymore. But while that may have worked for a couple years, it obviously wasn't sustainable. It just goes to show that you can try to game the system, put as little effort into your work as possible, and it may work initially, but it's gonna catch up to you at some point. However, while what they did wasn't noble, they still created some of the most memorable gaming experiences for me of all time, even if they were all horrible. Uh, just going from Ninja Breadman to Anubis 2, from Action Girls Racing to Myth Maker Supercar GP, and just seeing the same damn game, that sticks with you. It's good that they're gone, but man, they gave me one of my best Christmas memories of all time. And I just wish I could give them as merry of a Christmas as they gave to me. I wish they were back making games again today, just for a little bit. Near the end of their life, they were actually trying a bunch of new things. I want to see how much their projects would have evolved these days. I just wish I could tell them... Merry Christmas Day to design. Junior League Sports on Nintendo Switch? Crazy Mini Golf on Nintendo Switch? Never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind.